So welcome to the second day of the Under Commons and Constituent Power virtual conference. Thanks for joining us. I'm Rose. There we go. Now I'm Bella. <laughs> uh, yeah. And Rose and I wanted to uh, thank everyone on behalf of the organizing committee. Um, welcome everyone to the four day virtual conference. We're grateful to everyone who attended yesterday's panel on the virus and the uprising. And we hope everyone will join us for tomorrow's panel on hostility inside and around the fort, fugitive approaches to COVID era conflict. And that'll be at 1 p.m. And I'd like to welcome our speakers for today's panel, our guests around the world, and give a special thank you to the other members of the conference organizing committee, uh, Mia Beach, Nicole Siegel, Kieran Ahrens, Nick Bergen, Ben Robinson, and Jay Cameron Carter. This conference would not have been possible without the hard work of each of you. So thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, and so to start, this conference um, aims to collect and share what we've learned from the practices and forms of life that are already breaking free of the catastrophic politics of our time. We have imagined this as a forum through which a pool, uh, through which to pool strategic and conceptual responses to the twin crises that have overturned the global order this year, namely the pandemic and the uprising. While rooted in the urgencies of the present, we also feel the importance of drawing upon deeper lineages of intellectual and political thought by weaving connections between the black radical tradition and Italian autonomia, each of which signals a bifurcation and a rupture with established discourses rather than settled historical events or canons. And uh, we'd also, I'd, I wanna thank our sponsors. Um, thank you to Indiana University's Institute for Advanced Study, where I am currently, um, the College of Arts and Humanities Institute, the Office of the Vice Provost for International Affairs and the Department of American Studies and to all the admins who helped make the conference come together. So thank you all for that yeah and um yes thank you everyone for all of your hard work um it's been really incredible to work with so many people who work so well together uh for today's session uh we'll have three hours to talk and think together about anti-politics uh and the self-defense of the surround we'll open with poetry from billy ray belcourt then start with some introductory remarks from our panelists, Idris Robinson, two members of the Vitalist International, Kat and Paul, Marquise Bay, Stefano Harney, and Fred Moten. From there, we'll move right into conversation. Uh, so what we're all here for. Uh, and the discussion will be facilitated uh, by Ross Gay. After discussion between panelists, we'll have time set aside for Q&A from the audience. So if you want to ask a question to the, to the conversants, please write your question in the Q&A section, which should be at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, we're asking that all questions are directed to the panel as a whole and not individual pa panelists specifically to help cultivate a sense of commons. We'll collect y'all's questions throughout the discussion and send them to Ross during the question and answer portion of the conversation in order to be most efficient. And now we'd like to introduce today's conversation. Uh, we wanted to hold space for a discussion um, that's more so a conversation than a conventional talk um, to look around and to think together. We want to speak from the inside of this crisis of power, from the portal created between the burning of the first police precinct in the US and the burning of the next. We, as students of the Black radical tradition, the undercommons, destituent power, abolition, general strike, riotous assemblies, revolt, and maroonage, are excited to bring together this panel on anti-politics and self-defense of the surround. The conversation we're having today starts with a shared observation that Western ontology began with the separation of public from private life, and that politics today imposes and defends this delusion of enclosure. The city, the fort, the university, the institution, the home, the state, the nation, the citizen, the individual are all artifices of enclosure on different scales. 
With that said, we can also say that today we are part and parcel to a long running leaderless revolt in the streets across the globe. We feel in our shared breath and the soles of our feet that, quote, we got politics surrounded, as Stefano Harney and Fred Moten point out, pointing us toward anti-politics, lived practice and set of relations antecedent to politics and subjectivity, which they call the surround. Here surrounding, we're uncharted or as Idris Robinson said in his essay, how it might should be done, we struggle from within the constellation of riots, the paradoxical organization of disorder beyond any measure of control. It's here that participants in the George Floyd uprising are coming up with ethics rooted in anti-self-defense. As Robinson argues today, all that is constituted constitutive of the typical American citizen is slowly being worn away by the insurrection and the uprising. Through this refusal to be contained by a political order, this mass that wears away at the citizen, this dispelled hallucination of the world forced onto the earth, social life comes into focus. Stefano Harney recently said in conversation with Fred Moten on the podcast, millennials are killing capitalism, Insurgency is primary, rebellion comes first. We don't rebel against the police because there's police. The police come after us if we show ourselves as the primary antagonism. The police are there to separate us from our social wealth. So there we have it. With the revolutionary stakes set or upset as they are, the questions we have for ourselves are, what of our potential cannot resolve back into constituent power? What are we learning through the self-defense of the surround? What, how are we already preserving social wealth? What is our own abolition? Great. Um, yeah, so that's going to be the conversation. Super looking forward to it. Um, but now I'll introduce Billy Ray Belcourt, who's going to kick us off with a reading to establish a vibe of sorts. Uh, Billy Ray Belcourt is from the Drift Pile Cree Nation in Northwest Alberta. He is an assistant professor in the creative writing program at the University of British Columbia. His books are This Wound is a World, Indian Coping Mechanisms, and A History of My Brief Body. So please welcome Billy Ray. Hi. Hey. Uh, hello. Good to meet you, Rose. Um, and. Uh, I'm filled with deep gratitude to have been invited to be a part of this conversation in this conference. Uh, I'm zooming in from the uh, unceded ancestral and traditional territories of the Squamish, the Musqueam, and the Tsleil-Waututh. And as a guest, I myself am from Drif the Drifpal Cree Nation in Northwest Alberta and Treaty 8 territory. As a guest, I do spend a lot of time thinking about um, unseatedness as an incitement to particular kinds of ethical thought and practice and uh, poetic um, interventions. And I hope that <clears throat> uh, that figures into part of this conversation today. And I'll be reading poems from NDN Coping Mechanisms. So here goes. Loneliness finds me drunk in an old Billy Ray Belcourt poem. What's important is that wherever I am, my brother is perched on my right cheekbone. We are 24 and already too old for our own good. Last night felt like our last night. They always do. This is what makes night nightly in an amnestic nation against the literature of treason. Behind the wheel of a car without headlights, the night is a lukewarm mouth we sing into. In other words, where the heterogeneity of grief meets the singularity of death is the Indian experience. Today, the ministry of historical ignorance didn't keep me and my brother safe. With his extra legal powers, the ministry brought us to our knees so as to clog our throats with polluted language. In defiance, we licked the walls dirty in a house of administered subjectivity. Don't blame us. Our last hope, a fever, is sunlight breaking apart inside the skull. This is a poem after Saidia Hartman called The Terrible Beauty of the Reserve. Everyone's uncle thinks they're the world's most handsome Indian and no one says otherwise. 
res dogs roam about without having to perform emotional labor for humans. They eat where they are welcomed, which is everywhere. Most who live here do not know they are in the ruins of a failed experiment of epic proportions. Teens blaze to feel the euphoria of being outside memory. We all bathe in the sociality of the hangover. It isn't that no one has time for themselves. It is that they are always playing cards or talking about hockey player Connor McDavid or carpooling to bingo or babysitting their brother's kids. We all owe something to someone. So we congregate under the presumption of debt and this is always already. We all joke about falling in love with our cousins, but we are all perpetually falling in love with our cousins in a platonic way because we grew up together and no one was alienated by the tyranny of the couple form. Vehicles pass through in droves, but no one looks, so we disappear, hands intertwined into the freedom of a shimmering anonymity. Sorry, just skipping ahead here. NDN Homo Sonnet. An NDN is the ellipsis of a nation. Even in God's palm, a homo is a yearning the size of a world. Is an invisible spectacle a paradox? Is a good melancholia? Mathematically speaking, an Indian homo is a metaphysical conundrum. Put differently, I am a mother before all else. Maggie Nelson speculates that a mother is the archetypal Levinasian subject, which is to say, my lover is a hooked finger in the mouth of a planet. He is a dancer. To him, my living is the sound of an emptying. When I die, it will still be autumn in my body. I trust he will dust my shadow off so as to watch it tangle in dusk's wild mane. I was a windswept eye from the start. I'm going to read a few sections from a poem called Melancholy's Forms. Spilled, unbound, remote, unsafe, melancholy swells in the badlands of modernity. There it rejigs words so as to expose that which is always in excess of what we utter, a chorus of linguistic surplus. This isn't so much about an anthropology from below, but a desire to beget the finality of desire, to roam instead through the underground of semiotics. We speak polyphonically against the white noise of the present, its fable of the world, to become a public enemy to the poets. We tiptoe into the field of vision of the sky to make ourselves judiciable. Under siege in the barracks of the prairies, we concoct our own social experiment, one without end, an unmoneyed one, alive and indeterminate, but always rebellious. Tomorrow, we surrender to the frenzy of the surround of the surround. In the back alley of the world, melancholy is a utopian feeling. The back alley is both a metaphor and a material condition. It is a deformity of the law. There the codes of public life are upended and everything and nothing is criminal. In an archipelago of exile like ours, there are crowds everywhere. For a second or two, everyone has but one skin, wired to the feeling of being on the run. It isn't that we are escaping life, but that we were stranded by it. An ocean flooded the basement of us. Always in and out are durational concepts and thus they fail to provide any sense of place. Indeed, the sole orientation one can have is that of vertigo. GPS is a relic of a bygone era. Flags are always at half mast, which is to say ours is a no man's land. Tonight, we make a country out of one another. And this is from a poem called Red Utopia. Find me cruising in the back alleys of Google Earth. I was busy thinking about boys, boys, boys. I was busy dreaming about boys, boys, boys. That's Charlie XCX. Selfishly, I want a world where no one has abs. I want a world where there are no ghosts in the machine of relationality. Intimacy will not be a trapdoor. A trapdoor will not be a refuge. A refuge will not be whatever dulls the sensation of aliveness. Aliveness will not be hope against all odds.
I look at the underbelly of the map. Locatable there is that which lives below the threshold of social reality. Rogue, unwatched paradox in living deontologically dead. Un, 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 a prefix is a portal. The astray is a concept I have not given up on. I argue that the astray is a geography below or beside the everyday. Doomed lovers and historians of the future are its tenants. There, the temporality of love is sped up and thus engenders a modality of intimate life that is feral. The haptics of ferality convulse, contort, lurch. Everywhere there are eyes on me slash us. They fall from me slash us like mud. The headlights of a pickup truck are two lightning bolts tossed at a dead body. It is dawn. The past hiccups, dogs bark back. The res opens its eyes. Women encircle the boy on the highway. The religiously minded suspect God placed a child there himself as though composing a work of art comprehensible only from a bird's eye view. Death codified in this way is an aesthetic experience for which no one is answerable. Others, however, believe blame is a hungry beast, that its heartbeat is theirs. To their minds, a boy lacerated by wind represents the history of a country. The res opens its mouth, screams. And lastly, uh, this is the poem that closes the book called I Believe I Exist. Without hope, I'm a thick fog stained by what I gobble up, something to weather. Under a starved light, I'm a sticky dance floor on which a poem has been written. On Saturday nights, I get stickier and stickier until I'm not a dance floor anymore. Someone death drops. Yes. Someone drops dead, but he is in white, so no one is there to see it. Except everyone is there to see it. They're just too busy thinking about how much they have changed for the better to open their fucking eyes. I'm a drag queen named Commodity Fetishism. I perform to Rihanna's bitch better have my money, except by money, I mean body. I'm an abstraction of an abstraction of an abstraction and so on. I am a glass half shattered. What is a ghost to a ghost but photocopied pity? Sometimes I want the language of a non-place but no language is placeless. Prove to me that he who despises the world isn't also transfixed by it. I believe I exist to live one can be neither more nor less hungry than that. I believe I existed. One can't be left hungrier than that. Thank you so much. Wow, thank you so much, Billy Ray, for um, those incredible poems. Um, that book is really kind of uh, world shattering in, in my view, so check it out. Um, so uh, now, yeah, thanks so much for being part of this, Billy Ray, that was incredible. Um, now I'm gonna introduce uh, Ross Gay, who is our facilitator for the event, um, for this conversation. Uh, Ross Gay is a dear friend, collaborator, poet, writer, and thinker, without whom I wouldn't be myself which is to say he makes up a part of my body, which is to say a part of my mind, which is the body too. Ross is the author of most recently Beholding, which you should probably go read right after this panel because it's gonna make you fly. And he's also written a collection of essays that um, changes how we look at the world called The Book of Delights um, and several books of amazing poetry, including a catalog of unabashed gratitude. Um, Ross teaches poetry at Indiana University. Um, and I just wanna tell you all that the other day we were in the cemetery singing Frank Ocean together. Um, everyone please welcome Ross Gay. <laughs> <laughs> That's so great. Thank you, Rose. Um, yeah, I'm uh, glad to be with you all and that um, reading Billy Ray was just God, so fucking beautiful. Um, so thank you for that. So um, I'm gonna introduce um, folks and then they're gonna present a little bit and then we'll kind of circle together and have a, have a conversation. 
Uh, but yeah, thank you, Rose. I feel um, I feel the same about you, and I feel like singing Frank Ocean in the graveyard was uh, that was the truth. Okay, so um, first up is Idris Robinson. So Idris was asked to join this panel after he gave a talk at Red May in Seattle called How It Might Should Be Done. And he's prepared a video variation of that talk for today's discussion. He's a PhD candidate in the Department of Philosophy at the University of New Mexico with a research focus on contemporary continental philosophy, early analytic philosophy, ancient Greek thought and open comparative uh, philosophy. He's currently working on a dissertation on the role of paradigms and logical morphology in the works of both the early and mature Wittgenstein. Most recently, Idris published an elegy lettered to Michael Raynal, an anti-fascist activist killed after defending himself and a friend during the political unrest in Portland. Um, please welcome Idris Robinson. Hey, uh, thanks for that intro, it was really nice. Um, and uh, so I don't have much to say about the current situation. So we decided to uh, put together a video. It's directed by, I wanna say my, one of my closest friends and comrades, Jamie Weiss, and he's also an insanely talented filmmaker. Um, we did the Black Leadership video together by the, and we were the We Still Outside Collective. There's one other cat in the collective who's gonna remain anonymous, but he's, a, he's just a total genius. Shout out to him. Um, I guess since I'm broadcasting live, I gotta give shout outs anyway, I gotta give some more. So I wanna say solidarity to all the recently arrested in Atlanta. Um, and in fact, amnesty for all the prisoners of the uprising, free them all. Uh, I also wanna send solidarity to the insurgents in Nigeria. And I think they've been very inspirational to us. We should look to what they're doing. They've shown us the way. They also shown us how to free prisoners the right way. So um, we should think about that for our amnesty for all movement. Uh, a few more shout outs. Uh, shout out to my fiance Mariah on the left coast. Shout out to John Clegg and Shaman. We've been working on all these texts together over the past few months since the rebellion started. Uh, give better to my mom and my Aunt Brenda and shout out to Slee for uh, all the help she's given us in the past few days. All right, let's rock this video. Peace y'all. We all saw it. We all saw what happened after the murder of George Floyd. What occurred was an extremely violent and destructive rebellion. It was a phenomenon the likes of which we have not seen in America in 40 or 50 years. fact occur. The progressive wing of the county insurgency seeks the denial and disarticulation of this event. This is true. While spearheaded by a black avant-garde, this largely multi-ethnic rebellion managed to simultaneously overcome codified racial divisions. The containment of the revolt aims at reinstating these rigid lines of separation and policing their boundaries. Thesis three, by avoiding the morbid liminal core of white supremacy, identity politics, intersectionality, and the social privilege discourse comprise the most sophisticated sector of this police apparatus. Thesis four, the insurgency cannot be confined within any one circumscribed social sociological category. By necessarily exceeding all classification, it is an excluded remnant detaching itself from all that binds together the American wasteland. Consequently, this combatant formation can only be defined in terms of this movement and its development as that which emerged during the first weeks of the revolt and which would dissolve itself upon the full completion of a revolutionary project. 
thesis five. The so-called black leadership, therefore, cannot and does not exist. It is a tremor to be found exclusively in the white liberal imagination. Thesis six. The current crisis derives from a contradiction that proceeds from the two Janus space sides of post-Cold War American governance. An inconsistency between the demands of a sovereign imperial state and globalized biopolitical security. As a result, the Metropolitan Center has begun to experience a sort of chaos that is classically sown within the colonial periphery. Thesis 7. As the rebel slaves did with the periodic outbreaks of yellow fever in Haiti, there is a hidden partisan knowledge to be uncovered surrounding the novel coronavirus pandemic that can also be exploited and weaponized against established power. Thesis 8. The insurrection would involve precise coordination from within the constellation of rights. The paradoxical organization of disorder beyond any measure of control. Accordingly, the problem of insurrection has equal parts social and technical dimensions. Thesis 9. Thesis 10. The fulfillment of the revolutionary project is ultimately an inescapable ethical obligation that each of us have to the dead and the exploited. We owe the revolution to the millions of slaves who never knew a second of freedom. What the long list of martyrs who have fallen during this uprising deserve from us is nothing other than the completion of the revolution. The dead of the struggle stream off of vengeance. We must avenge their deaths. Not even the dead will be safe from the enemy if he is victorious. Tonight, it's the night to begin to settle accounts once and for all, to end their victorious reign upon the globe and to allow the dead to finally rest. Thank you, Idris. Um, next are the Vitalists. Um, and the Vitalist International is a global network of monks and delinquents. Uh, hang on one second. I'm having my little Zoom situation. All right, cool. Um, the Vitalist International is a global network of monks and delinquents, which came together in March of 2018, which is to say after Charlottesville, say after Standing Rock. The Vitalist International develops and researches methods and frameworks for a life beyond economic and political calculation in talks, videos, graphics, and interventions from Hong Kong to Chile. They are building new heresies for the 21st century. We have two of its members presenting from Atlanta, Georgia. Welcome to Vitalist. Can you hear us? Yeah, all right. We live after the George Floyd rebellion, not merely in the midst of a global pandemic, not merely in the midst of the breakdown of the American political system, not merely in the midst of a questioned election, not simply in the time of what many would call the Black Lives Matter movement, but after the 2020 summer rebellion. The rebellion of this summer manifested as a response and not importantly as a reaction to the murder of George Floyd. From there, it took on the contours of roughly five modes. First, the immediate reaction to the death of George Floyd in the final days of May, culminating in the widespread unrest and the burning of the third precincts by thousands of protesters. Secondly, about a week of massive looting of shopping districts and rioting in city and town centers in hundreds of municipalities across the country, especially at the beginning of June. In this phase, Millions of people seize the time and space necessary to freely construct a proportionate response to Floyd's death. 
In the third mode, beginning with the killing of Rayshard Brooks in Atlanta, local insurrections responded to police murders in Rochester, Kenosha, Lafayette, Louisville, and elsewhere. These forms did not renegotiate re power across in entire cities, but they did allow Black people and other people of conscience to retain control over political and ethical priorities within their context, keeping police and city governments alike on the retreat. Contemporaneously, but nevertheless in an additional fourth mode, protesters began to construct autonomous zones in city centers and to wage iconoclastic attacks on Confederate and colonial monuments. This allowed protesters to broaden the scope of the movement after police were indicted in Minneapolis and to retain the tactical initiative even as the crowds diminished in size. In the fifth mode, starting around July 4th, seemingly focused crowds of prepared and apparently experienced fighters carried out targeted attacks or willfully engaged police. This coincided with ritualized and dramatic street battles between protesters and police in Richmond, Seattle, and most famously, Portland. Among the attacks were the scandalous clashes and vandalism of the Christopher Columbus Monument in Chicago, the burning of the construction site of the juvenile detention center in Seattle, attacks on various police and law enforcement headquarters in Atlanta, the torching of courthouses in Oakland and Colorado. This mode shares commonalities with the previous modes that represented the twilight of spatial or tactical innovations within the movement. At the end of July, we argue, we see the undeniable waning of mass activity affiliated with the George Floyd Rebellion. At the same time, upheaval has by no means ceased entirely. Occasional flare-ups and explosions, typical of the third mode of the rebellion, are still taking place, as we saw in Philadelphia in the week before the election following the killing of Walter Wallace. Idris has said, a leaderless and multiracial rebellion did in fact take place. Yes, we elaborate. That the George Floyd rebellion took place means that an antagonistic autonomous movement has exposed the biopolitical project of Western civilization by attacking it. Within struggles, the terrains and terms, the sides and stakes of the antagonism are themselves also under constant contestation. The appraisal of forces, the calibration of risks, the clash of the infantry, all of this could be understood not as the factors of a battle generically, but the anatomy of a specific conception of warfare. As the life war continuum is consciously blurred by modern industrial states, and the mobilization of public affects, anxieties, and prejudices are increasingly mobilized into a bipartisan culture war, Emancipatory actors must reflect on the terms of the terms, not to struggle only against opposing camps or enemies, but the terrain of unfolding hostilities itself. Western governance maintains public order by regulating, steering, facilitating, abandoning, killing, and controlling biological existence within our species and life forms with which our species interacts or depends. What is permitted and what is possible are constantly paired as unregulated life is consistently associated with scarcity, uncertainty, suffering, and blackness. But from both the perspective of governance and that of the governed, the biopolitical task has been upset. As David Wallace Wells and other climate analysts have shown, we have exited the so-called human climate niche the existence of our species on this planet for roughly 350,000 years has taken place within a specific set of relatively delicate conditions that no longer seem to have a reliable future. With carbon parts per million exceeding 400, ocean acidification wiping out marine life, biodiversity collapse, and a myriad of other sophisticated ecological problems undermining the basis for complex terrestrial existence the possibility of fulfilling the mandate of biopolitical governance to administer, regulate, and govern life is itself called into question. At present, around 1,000 Americans per day are dying of the coronavirus with no plans in place to contain the uncontrolled spread of the disease across the territory. This summer, 
Over 500,000 Oregonians were displaced from catastrophic wildfires that spread from California to Washington state. It is thus little surprise that contemporary revolts adopt positions not simply regarding inequalities or corruption, but against the terms of life itself, of what life matters and of what is worth dying for. In our era, life is both the terrain and object of an ongoing conflict. But what type of conflict is this? Contemporary governance tends to transform all antagonisms, latent or sudden, into a contest of a basic shape, that between constituted groups with articulable or coherent interests and normative figures to represent those groups. And from a certain perspective, much of the events we know now as the George Floyd Rebellion can be understood in precisely these terms. For instance, after the initial days of revolt in Minneapolis, the deep on the police program gained purchase within media as the ostensible demand of the broader rebellion. Specialized groups constituted themselves within the movement. Armed security teams guarded autonomous zones, organized right wing and white supremacist militias deployed throughout the Pacific Northwest. Bands of armed anti-fascists confronted libertarian militias in Kenosha, Seattle, Portland. The chaotic flux of the revolt is reframed as much as it can be as a sectarian battle between BLM Antifa members and a right-wing specter variously described as Boogaloo boys, neo-Nazis, proud boys, or simply MAGA extremists. Vast reservoirs of feeling and energy are reimagined as intentional and organizational interiorities. This style of conflict emerges when the initiative of rebellious actors is not powerful enough to break the time or space of the ruling order and must militate within given configurations of power. And yet a struggle over the terms of a conflict is hidden inside every confrontation, however much it may be concealed. Beyond the clash of opposing forces, there is also a struggle between concepts of victory and defeat and over the nature of hostility itself. Does the form of antagonism produce intractable polarizations such that the resolution can only result in the absolute elimination of one or both parties? Does it tend to reconfigure the structure of the society around it or is it a conflict that spectators can live alongside? Is the battle a paradigmatic fight between ethical opposites the resolution of which will fundamentally alter life as we know it. If one side loses, does the other side win? Does the fighting allow for various degrees of specialization of force, violence, and creativity, or does it tend to become more specialized, more violent, and less creative as it develops? The initial rebellion in Minneapolis, specifically as it culminated in the burning of the third precinct, was an example of the kind of struggle we want to see not simply because of the impressive and unthinkable acts on the ground, but because of what was made possible by the arrangement of forces in the first place. Anyone who is present for those final days of May can tell you that what took place on those afternoons and evenings was a genuine youth revolt with widespread participation among adults and young children. Having seized the free and joyous initiative over the time and space of battle, the rebels chose to make everything a festival. Skateboarders were jumping over piles of trash. Children were pushing carts of toys and fruit juices out of stores with their parents. Young lovers embraced in their oversized hoodies, gazing into each other's eyes as the smoking inferno behind them, the third precinct, cast everything in a dark orange glow. The police encountered hostile enemy forces engaged in a bitter and relentless urban guerrilla operation. They imagined coordinated and intelligent acts of sophisticated and possibly funded commandos. In fact, the police and the rebels were not on the same block, not in the same neighborhood, nor the same city. They weren't even in the same reality. With their preferred theater of operations, the modern metropole reduced to a smoldering playground and the psychological medium of their rule, consensus reality, absolutely vacated. The police wandered around the city as a desperate group of people with sticks and tear gas and nothing more. This is precisely the kind of conflict 
we believe that millions of people were able to initiate for about a week, asymmetric subversive activity in which non-specialized, mostly unarmed groups of all ethnic, religious, sexual backgrounds and of all ages could freely utilize time, space and infrastructure according to the unregulated initiative of their desire and the capacities of the people around them. Throughout the rebellion, forms of low intensity mass combat emerged as a decentralized force of frontliners, including mom blocks and dad blocks, mobilized from within their subjective spheres in a format that simultaneously subverted and challenged the normative coherence those spheres typically rely on. While these forms did not allow rebellious social forces to completely regain the initiative or to reimagine the theater of operations, nor to establish the kind of martial and phenomenological asymmetry reminiscent of the period of late May or early June, they did facilitate experiments in partial rearrangements of force, allowing for diverse elements to mix, allowing participants to, at the very least, retain autonomous initiative via v one another. But what has become of this conflict over conflict now that the actions of the summer seem to be waiting? It now appears as a dispute over the boundaries of the political itself. In the days leading up to the election, for instance, a truck affiliated with a Trump caravan in which a local official was participating fired on Black Lives Matters protesters gathered at the defaced Robert E. Lee Monument in Richard, Richmond, Virginia. At the polls, election defenders were called upon by both parties, giving the sense that the democratic institution itself is at risk. Particular actions undertaken in the course of the rebellion, in particular looting, arson, and the strange category of inciting a riot, are being persecuted not as politicized gestures, but as criminal activity, often described as opportunism that ran parallel to the otherwise legitimate protests. The Republican Party has still not ceased to question the results of the recent election, hoping to stoke their base into a partisan contest against the legitimacy of the electoral process itself. Demonstrations the week of the election in Portland, in Minneapolis, in New York City, were repressed heavily by police as drag racers and sideshow or takeover participants, a youth subculture with extensive participation in the rebellion of the summer, are simultaneously criminalized across the country. This is all to say that the domain of legitimate politics is once again under partial police control. Both major wings of the state are engaged in unified, though apparently opposed, attacks on the free initiative of human beings. By fighting one another in seemingly escalated conflict, the two major parties hope to reconstitute each other as the paradigmatic antagonism of the present. They are doing everything they care to make us care, to make us get involved, to bring us into the process, to force us to pick one of their miserable, joyless sides. As the basic assumptions of the Western biopolitical project are called into question from every side, the line demarcating periods of social peace from upheaval have begun to blur. Indeed, this is the peculiar conclusion required by any attentive consideration of the geographically and temporally disparate events colloquially gathered under the banner Black Lives Matter. The mass phenomenon we have called the George Floyd Rebellion has already been subsumed under this banner in the media. While a certain perspective accurately recognizes the continuity of challenges to the subordination and death of Black people in this country from 2014 to 2020, and another might also accurately point to the continuity between the Black struggles of our decade and those of the 60s and 70s, we must also recognize that we live in a decade in which a variety of conflicts proliferate. Over the past several years, and even more so in 2020, we've seen housing struggles, struggles over immigrant detention, over the border, labor strikes, teachers movements, student movements, prison uprisings, and even forms of unrest whose political significance is difficult to ascertain, such as the unusually destructive sports riots in LA. In our context, traditional conceptual apparatuses of revolt and revolution founder. Contemporary revolts do not represent a form of communication, do not coalesce around coherent identities to inform a new political subject, and they do not inaugurate a new universal experience of reality to be aggressively subordinated to advanced forms of algorithmic segregation. 
where many may imagine an increasingly self-aware and intelligent consciousness, a consciousness represented by a specific faction of society uniquely positioned to liberate the rest of the world from its woes, we see instead the steady accumulation of small realities, breaks and fragments tear away from an increasingly empty and meaningless center. It is in this context that the notions we believe we share with our co-panelists, and we hope they will correct us if not, gain significance. The first is the affirmation of an anti-politics, to use the term chosen by the organizers of our panel. Moten and Harney have expressed an, a similar notion in their conception of the surround, a scene of activity and livelihood be, beyond the enclosure of fort and common of traditional politics. Agamben too insists upon the necessity of thinking of politicized Zoe. Here, between these notions, we understand a politicized life independent of its entry into or qualification by politics in its institutionalized form. What is significant for us here is twofold. First, these notions attempt to avoid the postulating of a political ontological task, a be becoming human or becoming political that enables, expresses, and reproduces the exclusive inclusion that facilitates and expresses the white supremacy of the state. Second, it harbors the possibility of shifting the site of politics away from the terrain of contemporary governmental apparatuses onto the terrain of everyday life as we live it. Related is the second idea that we believe we share with our co-panelists, the affirmation of a primacy of revolt in relation to that which governs or attempts to capture it. As you know, Stefano Harney has recently put this in the terms that insurgency is primary, rebellion comes first. We don't rebel against the police because there's police. The police come after us if we show ourselves as that primary antagonism. How can we understand these two points? anti-politics and the primacy of revolt in the terms of the summer rebellion. As concerns something like an anti-politics, we understand that the rebellion mobilized lifestyles that were already to some extent present. Mutual aid networks set up to distribute food to those lacking in the pandemic became means of collecting and distributing supplies for frontliners. In some places, existing local bail funds grew 10 times over to support those arrested in the protests. Neighborhood solidarities became means of organizing for safety or for attack. Roommates became frontliner crews, moms and dads became fighting forces in their own right. Sideshows, which were in many ways tactical incubators for proletarian youth across the country, also demonstrated the absolute breakdown of police control within reclaimed urban spaces. Autonomous spaces, independent art galleries, local hubs of all kinds became gathering sites for meetings and informal organization. Organized crime, too, had its role to play. In this sense, the old demarcation between organization and spontaneity falls away, or is at least manifestly complicated. A plane of organization, of nascent, loose, near organic organization that was in many cases apolitical, organization at the level of daily life, is thus revealed beneath and beyond the parties, organizations, or nonprofits traditionally recognized as political actors. The primacy of revolt in relation to that which captures it follows neatly from here. It is in this sense that we characterize the rebellion not as a reaction to George Floyd's murder, but as a response, an expression of a myriad of sensible vital forces capable of changing to meet the demands of the situation. On this same plane, we now exist in a world populated by beings born in the rebellion. Crews of frontliners, massive solidarity funds, DIY and autonomous spaces whose political character has been elaborated and revealed. What happens to these molecular becomings now? The question of revolution may be one of a bygone era. Nevertheless, if we can speak still of a revolutionary task today, it is to nourish and cultivate the forms, practices, infrastructures, and tendencies that have potentiated rebellion, from mutual aid networks to neighborhood solidarities to car shows, and to encourage, strengthen, and embolden whatever has emerged in the wake of those summer months to protect it from repression, confusion, and erasure. These oases must resolve themselves to grapple an open conflict from time to time, and with methods and resources which are in no way presupposed, but which are developed through tenuous determination.
Thank you very much. Um, okay, next is Marquise Bay. Marquise Bay was asked to join the panel after publication of their book, Anarcho-Blackness, Notes Toward a Black Anarchism. Marquise is a core faculty member of the critical theory, of critical theory at Northwestern University, an assistant professor of African-American studies and English. And I say this next part with a cosmic gratitude for their prolific brilliance. Marquise is the author of multiple books. Their most recent monographs include The Problem of the Negro as a Problem for Gender, forthcoming from University of Minnesota Press in December, 2020. And the second forthcoming book is Black Trans Feminism with Duke University Press in late 2021. In some, Marquise's intellectual, academic, and sociopolitical concerns circulate around Black feminist theory, transgender studies, literature, and abolition. Please welcome Marquise Pei. Thank you all for being here. I um, also want to thank all the um, participants on this panel with me, um, as well as all the folks here in the audience, as well as all the care and work that you organizers um, put into putting this all together um, for us to, to gather here. Um, so I have some remarks for you all. It'll take maybe five or six minutes, but in light of some of the things said in the chat, I'm going to try to slow down. Um, so here we go. So I've tentatively titled it Coalitions, Coalition, Radicalities, and Discretion. And I begin with an epigraph from Judith Butler's Notes Toward a Performative Theory of Assembly. Quote, in a sense, the people you find in the street or off the street or in the prison or on the periphery work on the path that still is no street or in whatever basement that houses the coalition that is possible at the moment are not precisely the ones you chose. When we arrive, we do not know who else is arriving, which means that we accept a kind of unchosen dimension to our solidarity with others. I want to suggest that solidarity emerges from this rather than from deliberate agreements we enter knowingly, unquote. My concern is the coalition. Long have I been quite dissatisfied with the texture of terms like community as it skews too much for me toward a wholeness when I find more generatively unsavory utility in the fractured and broken. A fracture and brokenness much more elusive of hegemony circumscriptive and knowing tentacles. Coalition is undoubtedly messy, more though than the general messiness of people and their flights of fancy, their unlikable personalities at times. Coalition demands and inaugurates a reckoning. And in that reckoning is a radical indiscretion that in its indiscretion or the refusal to buttress and instantiate discrete delimitations fuels radicality. Coalition happens via non-sanctioned coming togethers. That is an excess of legible taxonomies and categorization themselves imposed and given ontologies that exist ahead of us that form us before we have a form or can choose a form or unform Coalition and radicality might more effectively arise through indiscreet, devious assemblages that do not map onto the state's grammars of demography. Coalition is not, to my mind, to be conflated with community. It is to stave off such co-optations as different colored hands holding one another or an uncritical embrace or rainbows, not least of which is because the city in which I dwell um, can proudly sport rainbow decals on their cop cars. I am quite thoroughly bored by calls for community that have as their fundamental aim the cobbling together of quote unquote diverse peoples in service of representative optics that ultimately obscure the violence of needing to be known and thus curtailed in order to participate in struggle. The violence of representational optics that monolithize and disallow generative dissent within a purportedly discrete sector of a grid, the violence indeed of a categoricality that coaxed them together as categorically different. What interests me is a coalitional groove, rubbing association, Rod Ferguson might call this, wherein we come together, revise what and how we mean in that coming together, mutate into an assemblage temporary as it may be that engenders a certain kind of force or politicality not predicated on subjective discretion. In other words, coalition as an emergent unsanctioned indiscretion is not about you and me, and perhaps not even about us, but about the being and coming and becoming together in subversion of the very process that violently instantiates severed me's and you's. 
The traditions that have forged me, a Black radical one and a trans insurgent one, make indiscretion a generative imperative. From my vantage, Black radicality is an accretion, per the language of Cedric Robinson, that it's gifted the thinking that a subversive relation to power, which might go by the names of desedimentation, queerness, Black feminism, foundations one's subjective inhabitation of the world, while trans insurgency is expressive of an ineffable and corporeally irreverent torquing of the criteria for meaning making, which gestures like T for T, for example, mobilize across and in excess of taxonomies to ensure survivability, never presupposing or predicating this mobilization on identitarian or subjective sameness. All of this is to say that I'm loved by and thus try to proliferate not radical inclusivity, but radical non-exclusivity, a distinction that emphasizes that we are already rubbing and in proximity such that we need only to mobilize the generative frictions. We need not bring y'all in, y'all are already in, as we refuse this presumption that there is some kind of separation and separability between us, which allows for a clear cut us and them. There may be difference, surely, but not separability. And I must thank Denise Ferreira da Silva for gifting us with this knowledge. Coalition non-exclusivity means that we cast no one out, that no one is disposable, that in the rubbing and generative friction in the work is the always present possibility of one being changed radically by the rubbing and friction. I suppose what I'm getting at is the necessity of thanking the grounds on which we come into the work of coalition as capacious and shared with others. Coalition and its radical indiscretion marks the defiant togetherness of an unlawful assemblage, an unregulated and unvetted way of getting and going together. Ideally, sought after would be a raucous liveliness in the exquisite shadows that illuminate those things that promise something beyond our catastrophic situation, things that exceed what their context dictates in them of them and nevertheless desire something not this. We don't know what will arise if we come together in this way. To claim to know in advance would be lie the aim, as we would only entrench what might be into the current logics we have at our disposal. We don't know, and that is okay. We just want something else. A something that might simply be who we might become were we not required to be something from the start. Thank you. Thank you, Marquise. Um, and finally, um, we welcome Fred Moten and Stefano Harney. Um, Fred Moten and Stefano Harney are the authors of The Undercommon, Fugitive Planning and Black Study, one of the progenitor texts of this conference, and the forthcoming All Incomplete, both from Autonomedia, Autonomedia, Minor Composition. The authors collaboratively work with many theorists, artists, and other students of the Black radical tradition. Stefano Harney's latest work is The Liberal Arts and Management Education, A Global Agenda for Change, co-authored with Howard Thomas. He wrote Nationalism and Identity, Culture and the Imagination in the Caribbean Diaspora State Work, and State Work, Public Administration and Mass Intellectuality. Fred Moten has written multiple volumes of poetry, most recently, All That Beauty from Letter Machine Editions, 2019. His critical work includes In the Break, The Aesthetics of the Black Radical Tradition, and the trilogy Consent Not to Be a Single Being from Duke University Press. Please welcome Fred and Stefano. Uh, <clears throat> Hello, everybody. I, I can't. Um, can you? I, I think I'm being heard. I hope so. Um, okay. I hear you, Fred. Okay. <laughs> All right. <Yeah. laughs> um, I, we didn't. <clears throat> um, did we have a plan? <laughs> you and me? Yeah. <laughs> I'm following everybody else's plan. Okay. Um, should I? Um, I, I I thought I didn't I didn't know what we were supposed to do. I I have something I can read that that we've been working on together. Um, should I do that? Yeah. Okay. Um, so anyway, okay. That that's what I'll do. Okay. 
Um, so uh, I'm sorry, everybody. Please bear, just bear with me for a minute. Um, what, what I'm going to read is uh, some we've been kicking back and forth with with each other. Uh, it, it's it's just a little um, piece uh, and. It's called Wind Sweep, <clears throat> uh, and it's uh, it's a uh, that word is a uh, a word coined by, uh, or at least I think it was coined by Gwendolyn Brooks, and it's in her great um, great little poem slash book called Riot. <clears throat> so this is called Wind Sweep. We breathe and ground and breathe the ground and breathe our ground. The theft of song and dance in study isn't as shocking as the dream of virtue makes it out to be. Rather than clutch our pearls, let's see how to remain impure. Capital agrees as it always has that black lives matter. And then there's the murderous undertow and overtones of its administration of that capitalized, trademarked mar mattering, in which final accounting, the summation of every dead Black life and how much and how little it matters, is brutality, which is given in the various techniques of management, where policy and policing converge, carried out by the drone. Sometimes he regulates bodies. Sometimes he regulates thoughts. He's sent by capital, whether to quell the protest or to protect it in confirmation of the dictum. To say that a black life matters, either infinitely or not at all, is a dead reckoning. To say so reveals how the navigation of this world is inseparable from its conquest. It's the kind of moral and actuarial calculation that the captains of slave ships make. And when we who rightly hate such captains recite it under the very duress it generates, it means that the war of conquest in which we have been both victims and instruments has moved through bloody naturalization into a new phase in which we are its prosecutors as well. Having become, having become officers of the court, we hate or ought to hate ourselves. Anti-blackness, is that this can and must be so. <clears throat> George Floyd is another name that now we give in unremitting predication, in profane and devoted questioning to blackness and its ongoing resistance to arrest. Blackness is resisting arrest. We don't lose sight of the fact that as they die while resisting the arrest through which they come into their own, a child, a father, a brother, a friend, an incalculably open set are killed. Under common life is killed and killed again, not only as the arrest and its arresting image proliferate, but also in how we are enjoined to honor the interplay of self-possession and dispossession in their name. What we see, not only in chauvinistic murder's gruesome duration, but all throughout the whole drama that comes hard upon friends trying to get some sustenance to share in refusal of the world is the regulative assault on the social source and resources of refusal, which Manolo Callahan after Ivan Illich calls the war against subsistence, which is the war of conquests other ruthless calling. In the ambient echo of our counter naming, which anticipates and never ends, to speak of Floyd's death wrongs them in the very establishment of himself that his murder confirms. His personhood having been imposed in the one thing the world will have let him call his own. Robbed of our panonymity and thrust into the vicious drama of being nameless and being named, all we have is that we want his name unsaid, as Kinesia Lubrin says and says again in radiant gathered under nomination. Floyd's murder, their genocidal individuation 
is survived by the differences his name contraindicates. This is our muck, this is our mule, this is our music. What survives abjures the dismal negative self-possession entailed in the condition in which all that he had or could have had or could have was this death, this murder, which can't be shared, which interdicts sharing. And then subsequently, posthumously, some bullshit that in America's restricted economy is called justice, which of course he can never have had, but by which he will have always been had. Neither the murder of Floyd nor the carceral and systemic justice by which his body was taken at birth and death, nor the joyful, generally and economic justice we would righteously and all but naturally and supernaturally practice with them in and as and through refusal are his. Even less his than himself and his name, they ought never be construed as what will have been belonged to them, as what, as what will have belonged to them. Arrest, murder, and individuation are consubstantial. The literal text of liberalism's unholy trinity, which turns animated flesh into bloody stolen bodies. Let's say in the name of a general unnaming that naming again gives again and again, that George Floyd is living black in an illicit, homeless, anti-political economy of sharing. There, if it's not one thing, it's not another either till transubstantial seizure jumps off one more time as he was here and now he's gone. He was alive and now he's dead. What befalls the uncountable is that we don't count. But insofar as we don't count like that, they're not gone if we're alive. Even in this constant opening of our open flesh, our aspect is seen, unseen, and heard in black chance haptic microtones its burning savor, its pig foot fume, its riot going on. But we are unutterably altered. Store owners have no right, even at their low level of command, to act like they don't know what's bound to happen. Their calling is to call the drone and send him in their name as plague and grotesque image. Their right, which they exercise, is to maim, as Jasbir Puar shows. The pointillistic intensification of our general being in custody, singled out in total placement under the weight of extrajudicial decision, is what the drone is meant to do. Sora Han teaches that arrest is when an effusion of blackness, coming down in indiscreet wind sweep, like Gwendolyn Brooks says, falls into the equilibrium of dead black personhood, whose endless day in court is face down standing. And now, when we who are arrested in them but not with them exercise our right to protest, which is given in policed political disassembly, how do we not cover ourselves in the venal and irresponsible reduction of Floyd being murdered because they were living black to our being jacked up and hyped up because we are protesting? How do we not cover over the shared practice of refusing the citizenship that is refused with some burdened exercise of right, which we cannot have and should not want. When protest becomes the meta protest of the impossible citizen, its absurdity redoubled when Sprite repeats in all corporate sincerity that black lives matter, an all but confederate monument to our chain desire is erected. Movement is left inert and liberal fantasy finds its regular completion in mere petition. Reform is, of necessity, the next step in this square, perfectly circular dance. With disrespect to the coin of the realm, which is the pure expression of political sentiments eclipsed of socio-sentimental practice, we need to be spreading counterfeit money everywhere. Mutual aid, mutual ain't, mutual air. There's a kind of anti-charismatic cruelty that's got to drive our rapt and militant refusal to protest. In something almost like the first instance, it's full of the love that is destructive of intellectual property, forgiven in shared defiance of the commands of the choke-held chokeholder, 
sent by the one who owns them into self-fashioned, self-arrested, uncollected heads. The drone works for a homicidal drive and his protocols are lynching and suggestion. In silencing his hail with wailing and sincere misprision, we pray together on our, in our feeling, all elsewhere in our expression of it. Deeper still and past sincerity to the actual practice of differential authenticity. We love and share what we feel out from under liberalism's asphyxiated vocoding of it. The capture of the sociality that breeds that breathes anti-American pan-African revolt is intensified through integration's extension of segregation. When the racial management of capitalism more securely yokes individuation and incorporation as gift to individuation and incorporation as torture. Now we are acutely aware of that capture's constantly increasing intensification, which would stave off in the necropolitical body the necrosis it usually externalizes. We can't be made to save that body. We must refuse to be its antibodies. We forward its degeneration in regeneration of under common social practice. Without this shared working of the alternative, protest, which is conjoined with counter protest, even in their absolute moral asymmetry, is a hyperventilated confession of faith. We breathe against theft which is all property is, never rushing to cry out, never waiting to inhale. Let's destroy the very idea of property to refresh the common wind, which affirmatively blows in us against them for us. It's not about tearing their shit up. It's not about not tearing their shit up either. Fuck them and fuck their shit. Let's just generally tear shit up in absencing and presencing in destructive nourishing, in abolishing, as if we have no name. Thank you, Fred. Thank you, Stefano. Appreciate that. So I think everyone um, could un unmute and and get their cameras on. All right, thank you everyone for that. Um, and uh, yeah, that was beautiful. I, mean, I also wanna just say like, thank you for being here. Everyone has, you know, stuff to be doing and time. And so it just feels, I feel really grateful just to be in space with you all. And I think after hearing those, those I have a bunch of questions that I'll probably slow, but one of the things I think from the piece Fred, you just read, and I think it relates to everything that, you know, Marquise, the vitalist, Idris were talking about is this question at the beginning of, of that piece, which is let's see how to remain impure. And I'm sort of curious, you know, like um, on all of, the, all of the pieces that we read, like Marquise talking about coalition as opposed to community, there's a kind of openness to, there's a kind of openness to me that suggests, or a, a kind of impurity, there's a kind of potential or willingness for impurity or understanding of impurity. Um, um, the vitalist folks talking about ways that folks were doing things together and that was not a kind of pure, um, it felt like mixture is the word. And Idris as well, um, that there were folks doing stuff together that in a way like there's another kind of function to try to break, break that apart. So I just kind of wanted to ask the question of um, how do we remain impure? I think something like that. Um, 
I could say something. I guess like the the willingness to kind of act without certainties about the consequences or about um, um, the future. This is probably an important task uh, today, given that no no one actually knows what's going to happen. Lots of like political people and analysts and stuff are constantly kind of projecting and predicting the future or or demanding that people uh, have like a very clear articulated version uh, or vision of the future. Um, but really like being willing to be impure is like closely related to being confused, um, which actually comes from uh, the Latin word for to, to mix complicated elements, like to mix different things, specifically to pour more than one thing into the same cup is to confuse things. Um, so somehow it, feel, it feels relevant for me, right? So like not dissolving everything into one vessel, like what one, one substance that's gonna like project its, uh, I don't know, intention into the future, but uh, po pouring shit into a cup, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Anyone else have ideas about that? How do we remain impure? Well, I really like that. Um, I don't have too, too much to add to that. Um, so this is more of a kind of supplement to that. But um, one of the things I'm reminding of, reminded of, um, and I do a lot of citation just because I want to pay homage to um, the people who have gifted me with certain ideas. Um, so there's an essay by Che Gossett and Eva Hayward called Impossibility of That, um, in which they're doing a whole bunch of different things. Um, but one of the primary things they're doing is thinking about the, the value um, in, or the generativity in simply not wanting this insofar as this, where we're at right now, is corrupted on so many levels, um, or rather is um, violent on so many uh, levels. Um, how there is utility simply in not wanting this and not knowing what we might want in excess of, of this, but simply yearning for desiring the, the thing that is not this. Um, there's some utility and value there. Um, so oftentimes there is this desire or urge to know precisely um, what um, we are to, precisely what we are to, to want um, after we decide we don't want this thing. Um, but to simply want to think in excess of the very logic we have for intelligibility. Um, I think there is a deep, deep amount of value in that. And perhaps that's a way to remain impure, to not foreclose the possibility for the future. Mm -hmm. So here's another question. I, I mean, actually, Fred, could you say a little bit about that? Fred or Stefano about the idea of impurity or in that context, the way you're talking about it? Um, do you want to go, man? Well, um, I guess, um, you know, part of I, I I guess you know we we were over the course of the summer we were doing a lot of talks together and thinking and working on stuff together and thinking through things and and what we were like many people you know we were feeling you know a kind of ambivalence about the, what, what now, you know, net maybe we could call an, an uprising or an insurgency, um, you know, um, because of how, um, because of how swiftly and how easily it seemed to be sort of co-opted and assimilated into, you know, a sort of normative kind of liberal, you know, discourse. It's like, how can they, you know, how can, how can it be so easy for them to assimilate our feelings? You know, I guess was the question, but, um, 
And so maybe, maybe, and, and, there, and that assimilation, it seemed to, to us was a kind of purification, you know, mm. uh, uh, a sort of straining of those feelings of filtering of them, you know, so that all of the, the sort of impurities or the residue, the sediment, you know, of our, um, you know, you know, all that, all those, all the intensity, all the flavor, you know, <laughs> was, was being, was being strained out. And so, um, yeah, we, we wanted to, to try to see, you know, how we could begin to think about, you know, keeping, keeping all of that flavor, keeping all of that um, intensity. And, and also, you know, what that would then mean would be, um, you know, and I think this is something that, that Idris talks about, you know, in, in his essay, you know, was not falling into the trap of, uh, of, 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 of a kind of purification, let's say, or a purified understanding of, of, of our, of our riotousness, <laughs> you know? Um, and so that's why the Gwendolyn Brooks was useful, you know, not just useful, but inspirational, you know, Gwendolyn Brooks and maybe, maybe Slide and Family Stone, you know, that, that, mm -hmm. that, um, you know, and also just recognizing, you know, that, that, that the way we think of and conceive of, you know, mutual aid, that too already is a form of resisting arrest. Um, but it's a form of resisting arrest that is, you know, um, that, that has to be rethought constantly. Um, that it, it has to be, we have to continually try to better understand what that, what that means. That the arrest that is being resisted is, is maybe the arrest of individuation it, itself. Anyway, I, I, I won't go on, but uh, um, yeah, I, I'm going on mute now. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Uh, well, another question I had was uh, vitalists. You all use this phrase, and it was the life war continuum. And I was just wondering if you all could talk a little bit more about that, because one of the things I think um, that I mean, one of the, you know, I'm going to combine this with another question is that, and that question is something about how how does our our action or our impurity or our fugitivity sort of um, in the midst of the sort of profound ecological crisis or whatever the name for it is, this moment, these, this extended moment in many ways, how does it, um, how, do the, how do the rebellions, uh, how are they expressions of that or how do they fit into that? Or, but I do wanna hear you all say something about, a little bit more about that life war continuum. I heard that phrase and I thought that's an amazing phrase. Um, there's actually an essay, I don't remember who wrote it, that people should look up, just entitled, When Life Itself is War. Um, but essentially, and this is not like, not some like weird denuncio stuff or like kind of, I don't know, uh, other kind of total, total mobilization stuff, but it, it, it kind of, it, 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 from, that's not coming from us, but from the state's perspective, it is very much connected to kind of Nazi era um, strategies um, for governing. Um, essentially, just that counter, the idea is basically just that counterinsurgency takes an open platform, open, operates on like an open um, like theater of operations. So like music, art, culture, the news, um, the, the infrastructure, the organization of space, all of this is actually is actually considered as a part of uh, the war effort, if you will. Um, and the also medicine and just you know everything. And the war effort is basically just against the collapse of control um, is against the future, which is inherently unknowable. Um, 
And so just the life of war continuum is the constant blurring of militarized operations and the kind of uh, uh, maneuvers we might see on, on a battlefield, um, just taking place in all elements of life uh, and especially in cities, but, but not only. Um, also virtually and with information and with the governance of information. Um, I don't know, but, but, but I think like it, contemporary struggles must struggle over, also over the emergence of life. So it's like if the emergence of life, if the emergence of desires and social forms are, also, are what is being governed, um, struggles that deal with sociological imbalances um, are already occurring within the terrain of power and are not yet at the actual, they're not actually on stage yet. So only struggles which are able to contest, you know, basically the meaning of life on this planet and to control the emergence of social uh, forms. Um, only those struggles actually have even entered the fight, um, which I, I do think that the the struggles of basically the struggle of this summer, I think, did do that in some ways. Um, so that's a, a bunch of rambling mm -hmm. thoughts. But. No, no. Edith, could you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, I guess a little bit. Um, I was going to actually ask you guys about that. And um, um, I thought about, when I think about that, I think about this Andrew Lakoff text that just came out. Um, where he talks about essential workers being uh, kind of this category that comes from this total mobilization based on war. And I mean, so, you know, that's going on today. And I'm thinking about a Gaman's text recently, uh, the recent essay where he cites Younger, right, on, on total mobilization, what you guys are doing. But I wanted to ask the vitalist too, uh, can you give me, can you give some more concrete examples about these new societal forms that you see popping up? Yeah, so just to echo maybe and, and elaborate a bit uh, my perspective on the, the life war continuum, what I hear there is also the basic fact that we are all governed um, not only as citizens, but also as potential terrorists and as potential militants. Um, so there's that, that level on which we live um, and where our actions are surveilled and policed. Um, and so, of course, in that context, uh, politics of life um, sets itself against another politics of life. Uh, in terms of the social formations that we saw coming out of the rebellion, I wouldn't actually call them social. Uh, I have some concerns about this term social and society. Uh, yeah. But to think about the collective formations or sort of new creatures that were born in the rebellion, I think, I think really across the country, there are hundreds, probably thousands of wannabe anarchists or black insurrectionaries or, um, you know, new ultra leftists or people who are just participating in, in sideshows or hanging out in their porch, um, people who used to just be roommates um, who have suddenly found themselves with all these new capacities that they developed by attempting to go out on the front lines, um, but who lack, and I think it's a collective lack that we share, um, a, a sort of way of making sense of the present and how to move forward within it. Uh, and that's really, I think, a, a principle of our era in some ways where the 20th century models of organization, the 20th century idea of revolution just doesn't make sense in a landscape in which uh, the, the sort of underlying continuity of a social reality is itself challenged and absent from every side. How much of that is like practice, of the practice of witnessing those, those moments of, um, you know, gathering or um, being able to see, oh, that is, a, that is an example of the thing we're talking about. How much is, how much is sort of, um, I don't know, maybe the word is how important. I'm thinking of like uh, Cynthia Hartman's book and part of what uh, Wayward Lives and part of what, to me, that sort of broke open my world in part because what she was saying is like, it's here. This is right here. Like the otherwise is here. And partly what the, what the situation is, is you have to be able to sort of witness it and then articulate it and then practice it and study it. And I'm sort of curious about, I'm curious about that maybe sort of for all of you, how you all 
sort of think about that and maybe even the witnessing as a way of generating new movements. I can just carry on. Um, I, I also feel quite skeptical regarding this category of witnessing. I mean, what we don't want to be doing is taking academic um, sort of abstract positions on phenomena that are seeing that we're seeing unfold beyond us. Um, I don't think that we want to walk into the trap of saying, hey, you are a new collective formation. Um, therefore, you should join this movement or go go forward. Uh, I think what the task is for us is to continue uh, putting putting out signals, putting out uh, both actions and texts and thought and conversations that signal to everyone else, hey, there is a movement here. There is something that's growing. That's something that that we are all a part of, regardless of you know our differences and maybe even uh, be precisely because of those differences. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like something just all last thing. Where I know we're talking a lot, but I don't know if it, how much people know about sideshows, for instance. So it's like when hundreds of usually young people get in their cars, generally like kind of like, like, I don't know, Honda Preludes or something. And they like take over a space and then like do donuts in the middle of an intersection or something. But just as an example, this was, is actually a phenomenon that's spreading. Um, that's extremely multiracial, but predominantly black. Um, and like was important to the uprising, but is not actually you know, if like you go to a sideshow a year ago, you'll see, you know, people with lasers and throwing fireworks and like do rolling together as like 200 cars. Um, you know, it's so like many of the things that people consider tactical innovations of the uprising, they are for like political people, um, tactical innovations or whatever. Um, but like being able to like, Basically what I'm saying is the sideshow kids are all getting arrested and people should just bail them out, even though it's not protests. This doesn't respond uh, directly to the question as a whole, um, but the language of witnessing, um, I don't mind too, too much, um, but uh, a bit of a shift I wanna make um, in kind of apposition to witnessing is the language of someone like Kat Catherine McKittrick in terms of noticing. Uh, so witnessing feels to me just a little bit to um, spectacularize something, whereas noticing feels like a more quotidian, uh, low-key subtle kind of um, interrogation of the very mechanism that allow for life to happen. Uh, it's also, it feels to me, at least in Catherine McKittrick's argument, that noticing um, moves or shifts away from an emphasis on the spectacularization of death or, uh, or violence and more toward attempting to proliferate modes of life and living, um, to, to proliferate um, modes of, uh, or uh, more options for life chances. Uh, so the language of noticing might permit a, I don't know, uh, a quieter, more subtle, more quotidian way of thinking about how, how we can attend to the way that we are already living and attend to the way that we might proliferate more living. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Great. Um, I have a question um, that also kind of comes from from a lot of you all's um, what you've said today, but also things previous. And, and I don't know exactly how to ask it. Um, so I'm just going to sort of stumble a little bit and then maybe you all can. And it's a little bit like um, there's in, in, in things, in a lot of your writings, there's this sort of, there's a sense that, I mean, there might even be an explicit sort of like, this is for the dead, you know? Um, and there's also, again, I don't know exactly how to formulate this question. There's also this clear sense of like, what we want to be, what we want the world to be. And I'm sort of curious about in some way, like what, how do we even like, how do we think about like who how do we think about the future in the mix of this how are we how are we sort of how is thinking about the future a kind of i mean i think maybe marquise you said that it's an automatic kind of there's a kind of impurity to think about the future it might have been a vitalist um because you do not know and part of the practice of you know you have to you have to just you know you don't know 
But I'm also just sort of curious about that feeling of like how you, I'm curious about, I don't even know what the question is. Like, who is it, you know, we're honoring, you know, the rebellion, okay, you know, is occasioned in, in some way by George Floyd's murder. And it's also the future. I don't know, can you hear me kind of stumbling around towards something that, In a way, like, who's it for? I don't mean, I mean, I mean, like, how are we? I can't quite articulate it. I mean, yeah, just to jump in, right? Like, um, you know, I think it's, it's a, uh, there's a tension here between the future and the past, right? You know, and um, Benjamin used to say that, you know, it's the height of, social democratic reformism to fight for the future and the children, right? But of course we haven't achieved the revolution yet, right? But uh, we fight for the dead, right? Who aren't here with us. So, you know, um, uh, I, what, what I think, or I guess what we see during a rebellion, you know, cause we've raised the dead during rebellion and we fight on their behalf. So there's this sort of this tension between present, past and future, uh, you know, in these kind of struggles when the struggle really heightens and thickens and, you know, I remember, uh, to take it out of like an academic context, I remember being in Greece during the uprising in 2008. And I remember feeling just the, the lived experience of time change. And uh, that's something that I think that writing about uprisings always is trying to capture. Um, it may be impossible to capture in writing, but uh, it's something that I think we're always running after. So, um, anyone else want to elaborate on that some more? I mean, in some way, like Marquise, I am thinking of this, um, um, there's this quote where you're, those maroon, subversive intellectuals, fugitives, queers, feminists, anarchists, and rebellious workers meet to conspire together in the undercommons, a non-place where everyone is black, queer, anarchic, because they are changed by the undercommons, which is not a place you enter, but a groove that enters you. Um, and there's some sense of like how we are moved by, you know, what we do not know, how we are informed by, how we are shaped by what we do not know. Um, so in the, the question you asked, um, who's the future for, I really like that. Um, and I also feel like this answer is a cop-out answer. I feel like most of my answers are cop-out answers. I'm the <laughs> philosophical abstract, um, but I promise it's like genuine. Um, but in terms of who the future is for, uh, actually the, the Black Trans Feminism Project is dedicated specifically to for those who we don't know yet. Um, so in many ways, I might say the future is for the very people who have not been permitted to emerge yet. Um, the very people who, who the ground on which we currently have to stand is not cultivated yet for um, certain kinds of people, certain kinds of subjectivities, life, et cetera. Um, and it might also be the case that the future is for the future might be for the people, the things, the beings we might have been, but for this very project of Western civilization and metaphysics and ontology, um, that to me is the radical call for this uh, maybe even unknowable future, which is not simply um, to um, absolve us of having to deline delineate the future in its parameters, but precisely the enabling of something radically other than what we have now, which might allow for different kinds of life to emerge. And that's the kind of future I'm, I'm searching for, hoping for, looking for, yearning for, um, but I don't know what it looks like. And I hope that at least that's in part okay. Um, that's not to say that we don't have to have some kind of plan or don't have to study in terms of, or in ways that um, permit different kinds of mitigations of violence in the here and now. But nevertheless, I want, I want something that is currently unimaginable precisely because that might be the proliferation of, of a really radical life that we might not even have quite yet. And that to me is what I'm in search of, what I'm yearning for. Yeah, yeah. Well, I can also say what we don't want in the future, right? Like, uh, I don't know what it's gonna look like, but I can say 
future with no cops, a future with no judges, a future with no bailiffs. We can go even get them out of the picture. A future with no prison guards, a future with no capital, um, future we call communism. Yes to all that. Are there are there places where you see that? I mean, are there are there places where you um, you know that is sort of happening? I am. I'm just very interested in the otherwise right uh, now too. You know what I mean? I mean, I think the only thing we, uh, at least I see, right, is just the rebellion itself, right? Is the modes of communism that we can follow, or the modes of anarchy that we can follow, or whatever you want to call it. Um, uh, so, you know, what happened right after George Floyd's death probably was the closest thing we saw to it in, you know, in decades, so, or mm -hmm. what occurred over the past summer. And uh, what I tried to argue in one of those theses was that um, something emerged after that event and it's going to keep in, you know, whatever it is, is moving in that direction somehow. So. Mm -hmm. But uh, to say anything more concrete, uh, who knows, right? You know, mm -hmm. like Trump says, we've got to wait and see, right? I really didn't want to quote Donald Trump, but you know, I had to. <laughs> um, Fred or Stefano, did you want to add anything to that? Um, thanks, Russ. Um, I, uh, I've been a little quiet because I've just been happy to be able to listen to all of you and to be with you today uh, on this panel. In fact, if Billy Ray was still reading, I'd still be listening to him. So uh, thank you for, for, for this. Uh, um, I guess, Russ, I was thinking as Marquise was talking about uh, uh, cultivation that um, part of a step on the way to cultivation is sort of breaking up the ground that um, that's hardened under us right now, um, which again, you could talk of in terms of trying to get back to some impurity rather than a smooth surface, try to get back to some, uh, you know, uh, unfiltered uh, rather than um, filtrated uh, um, moment. And and I guess in that regard that I, I think we sort of think of this movement as a kind of like, uh, uh, I guess you maybe call it like a stray generosity, like mm -hmm. a stray generosity. It's not the kind of generosity that is that, that you know, uh, means one person being generous to another. It's kind of, it's kind of out there and it's stray in a way that, you know, it could get easily picked up by capital, you know, in which case it becomes a stray bullet and becomes deadly, right? right. But it also can stay stray in other ways and allow us to do this work maybe of, uh, you know, breaking up our ground. And for me and Fred, that ground, you know, is teaching um, um, and studying. Um, and it's not all that we are, but it's central. And, in, and without going on too long, in the last few months, while the movement was in the street, its generosity in a completely stray way has been changing, I think, our grounds, uh, mine and Fred's in particular, some of which you can hear in the piece, but um, you know, in, in, a, in a very flat-footed way, there's, there's people that we've been reading, um, and, and I wanted to quickly just mention two of them. One is there's a new collection out of the great Guyanese feminist activist intellectual and Daya. And that's brought to us uh, because of the hard work of another uh, younger generation uh, Guyanese scholars like uh, Alyssa Trotz who put that together, Kamala Kempadu who uh, interviews her, et cetera. Um, and what we learned from Andaya and her group Red, Thet, Fred and, uh, Red Thread in Guyana she says this very explicitly, she's working with poor women, working class women, and they're doing research, creating diaries. And she says at one point, she says, you know, these women are better researchers than me. I, I couldn't do this research. I might be able to do other things, but they're better researchers than me on what she regards as the most important bit of research there possibly could be. 
And then we, we've been talking about in the sign in this other book or talking around it more um, called Lessons from the Dam by the Dam. And this is the a collective narration of a freedom school project in, in New Jersey in the, in the 60s and 70s. And there's a key passage in it. And the key passage in it is about this effort at coalition that, that, that has to end. So the, the working class women in the project who started the Freedom School have invited some middle-class African-American women to, to work with them. And at a certain point, the working class women say, we, had, we loved them, but we had to send them away because they wanted to help us, but they could not accept that we were better theorists than them, mm -hmm. right? So I'm, we're putting these things together and what I'm suddenly realizing is I'm not as good a theorist and I'm not as good a researcher, you know? So what does it mean that I am a teacher? You know? uh, and Daya talks about this uh, in terms of saying, well, all that was left for me to do is some probing, she calls it, right? Um, so the ground that I think not just me and Fred were standing on, but I would say more broadly, anything like the formal education system, you know, there's an opportunity to break up that ground once again as has been done continuously, very most often in our country by black women and say, you know, um, whatever it means to be a teacher in this system, it means also that you were not the expert, that you were not the best and that your view is most likely not the most insurgent, uh, insightful, uh, important, you know. That's the ground to break up now, right now, thanks to this stray generosity, I think. And it's a ground that I would invite, you know, Fred and I do this and we do this, we're a collective. I would invite everyone who's sitting in a school and calls themselves a teacher and everybody sitting, calling themselves a professor to ask themselves this question, you know, does, does this expertise truly re reside with you? Are you the smart ones, you know? And, 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 you know, that can maybe lead to some new ways of, of, of studying, you know, uh, went on a little while. That's why I was shutting up in the beginning. Uh, but thanks for stimulating that, uh, that thought. Marcus. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that, I mean, I think, I think a bunch of us here teach and I think what happens if, what happens if we do sort of bring that to the classroom. Like what, what actually happens when we, you know, um, give away our professorness or give away our expertise or our mastery in, in the more kind of coalitional or shared expertise, expertise. Like what, you know, how does that, how does that change the whole thing of our, of our classroom? Um, yeah, that's right, Ross. And I mean, when Fred and I came up together, you know, one of the really most important influences for us was liberation theology, as well as Freire and stuff. And you know, there's this phrase, uh, preferential option for the poor. But these days, that phrase for us is much more like preferential option of the poor. You know? mm -hmm. um, so I think that's one of the aspects of this stray kind of generosity that we're experiencing if we, you know, if we're willing to. Mm -hmm. It also makes, you know, at some point, I know we're going to open it up to the audience questions, but I also want to sort of talk about like that, that thing, that um, sort of um, whatever you'd call it, like a, not being the professor, being a kind of sh in a shared space or sharing um, kind of disavowal of mastery in a certain kind of way, a kind of submission is also, it seems to me, like an also sort of acknowledgement and practice of entanglement in a way which maybe is also a way of sort of, you know, like if, if a practice of entanglement is also a way of sort of putting the individual to the extent that you're able to, like a practice of also putting the individual or the story of the individual a little bit to the side. I wonder if that's also happening in that, or if that's one of the sites where we can practice, practice entanglement in a certain kind of way. Well, I mean, I guess one way that we've been thinking about practicing entanglement or another word for that, well, there's several words, several names, several 
synonyms for that. Um, but study is one that 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 we've you know that Stefano and I have been using again you know under the influence of so many people that it's impossible to name even a fraction of them. But um, but study would be one word. Grounding would would be a word, um, which is Walter Rodney's word. Um, and if we think of grounding in terms of a kind of tilling, in terms of cultivation, um, and if we think of grounding and cultivation and tilling as aeration, as mm. literally making the, the ground breathe, mm. right? Um, then, then all those terms, you know, they, they, they go together. Um, but I also think that this sort of practice of entanglement is, you know, I mean, I, I again, it, it, it's, if we conceive of, if we can now talk of something called the George Floyd uprising, I think it's really important to suggest at least, or to begin to try to imagine that George Floyd had already been involved in that uprising. In, in the particular ways in which he lived and, and what he was doing when he was arrested, which is to say when he was murdered, right? And, and again, Sora Han teaches us how to understand the absolute entanglement of those two terms too, because mm -hmm. entanglement is neither good nor bad except for how we practice it, right? Okay, it's a physical fact, but it's not a moral fact. Um, but, but if we recognize that he was already involved in, a, in an uprising, already involved in entanglement, and in a way, his involvement in that entanglement means that the personal pronoun his is actually inappropriate to, to George Floyd because it's inappropriate to the entanglement and uprising that, that they were already a part of. Mm -hmm. um, and it was and very specifically a modality of, of, of mutual aid and mutual sustenance, you know? Um, it's not an accident that it was Michael Brown walking down the street with his boys, you know? Or Eric Garner selling Lucy's on the street, you know? Um, the, the, what, was, <laughs> what was at stake was the suppression and repression of alternative economic activity. You know, I mean, it was not, it was whatever it was, it was also that, you, you see. So, so all these terms, um, the, the, this notion of, of grounding and aeration, or there's a beautiful Haitian Creole word, rassemblage, you know, that, uh, that Gina Ulysses talks about. And then Jackie Alexander picks that term up. You know, it, it's, in other words, we live out already the history of an ongoing insurgency. Mm -hmm. um, this present insurgency is an extension of that. Um, but I think sometimes when we overvalorize the figure of the insurgent and when we overvalorize insurgency as a separable event, we take some of the steam off of this ongoing insurgency. And I actually think that that's one of the ways in which insurgency is constantly being purified to its detriment, right? Um, and, 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 and so it turns out that maybe this is a strategic problem that we have to think through, that, that one of the things that the history of the insurgents who want to valorize insurgency, one of the things that, that, that the history of that has that that history has to, to to well there was a moment when I believe um at the very beginning someone suggested something about how it is that the beginning of western ontology is in the separation of 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 some, I forget exactly what was said but I guess what I'm maybe what we we want to think about as a function of your question, Ross, is how 
maybe the beginning of Western ontology is just separation as such, right? Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that that's what, that, what Marcus was getting at by way of Denise De Silva. So how does this interplay, this nefarious interplay of separation and purification, how does it actually manifest itself when we begin to try to understand insurgency, particularly when we begin to try to understand it as a separable event carried out by separable subjects. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Can I jump in here? Uh, Fred, I really appreciate your putting pressure on the idea that there's a, a line demarcating uh, times, and I'll use my earlier words now, time, times of uh, social peace from times of upheaval. Uh, I think in a lot of anarchist or radical traditions, um, there is a tendency to conceive exactly as you said of social movements or insurgencies as something discrete from, uh, at a distance from the life in which we live ordinarily. And it's actually by way of that gesture that we get um, people who conceive of themselves as revolutionaries, uh, you know, as distinctly revolutionary. And I really like and I really appreciate the, the work that you all have done to try to point to a plane um, that allows us to see through these moments um, as not just moments, not just manifestations, but as actually there's an undulating force that cuts through the social movements. And that's what we want to be on. That's what we want to ride on. That said, I feel like we need more, more, more nuance here. And maybe by we, I mean I. I would like more nuance here in terms of how, how, how do we affirm a continuity between, or a consistency at least, between these forms of autonomous existence or um, abandoned existence and the moments of upheaval um, that doesn't overwrite or overemphasize the distinctions between them um, but does pay, pay homage to the near eventual break that takes place between the one and the other. Do you want to go? Yeah. And, and, and to, to extend that, like, if we, if we retain this connection between the event and uh, kind of da daily life practices and fu fugitivity, what is a new thing? How do <laughs> ideas get produced? Where do they come from? How do things change? And how is insurgency not strictly a function of governance insofar as daily life is governed? Um, like, like th these are the types of questions I would have for, for those of us who do see, you know, the, the like insurgent events emerging from a kind of substrata. Um, I don't want to just keep talking all the time, but, but I'm, I'm kind of thinking that maybe I'm supposed to respond to, to these points. So, uh, just very briefly to say that, uh, you know, I, on the one hand, I, I can't sit here and act like I have some kind of definitive answer to your questions. And on the other hand, I do kind of want to deviate from the metaphysical ground from which those questions emerge, um, you know, and um, and really, really, that's and and of course, you know, to deviate from the ground from. In other words, the, the metaphysical foundations of, the, of, the, of, the, of, a, of a certain idea of emergence, the metaphysical foundations of a certain idea of, uh, of, 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 new, of the new or of separable things. Um, and, and, and recognizing that, that the metaphysical foundation of the new or of the separable thing is also the metaphysical foundation of politics, right? Um, and so, um, which is why it might be useful or necessary, if only for a minute, to, to think through the, the possibility, let's say, of, of the anti-political with, with an E or with an I. Okay. Um, so 
I, I don't, I'm not gonna, I, 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 I recognize the absolute legitimacy of the, of the conundrum that y'all raise. And then I, and I recognize that it's very unsatisfying to suggest that maybe part of the way that, that the way that the modality of thinking from which those conundrum legitimately emerge might also be a, a problem. This is an unsatisfactory position to, to be in. But but what if it's but what if that unsatisfactory position is also what it is to, to be to ground, to be on the ground, right? And here what we might do is, you know, to, to follow along maybe with a certain idiosyncratic reading of Sylvia Winter in order to suggest that that there's a kind of that there's a consensual field of theory and practice okay um a consensual field of theory and practice within which the conceptual okay which is all bound up with separability right it's <laughs> There's this fucked up way in which the conceptual is inseparable from separation, from separability. That's how the concept is given. So what if there's a consensual field which surrounds our capacity for conceptuality? Doesn't eliminate it, but surrounds it in a way that won't allow it any further to be determinative. Okay. But if that's the case, it can't be determinative even in our refusal, okay, of the fucked up political, eco political economic field out of which conceptuality, or, or uh, the fucked up conceptual, the fucked up political economic field that emerges from conceptuality, okay, um, that emerges from, as, as, as was said, the, 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 the sort of ontological commitment to separation in the first place. Okay. So, Again, I, I I recognize that what I'm saying is is unsatisfactory. We 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 find ourselves in an unsatisfactory place, you know, and 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 again, this is what Stefano and I have been trying to muddle through this, you know, for the last six months, and 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 so that's why reading. And I'm not even really fully sure how to pronounce her name, but Andaya, you know, that's why reading her and reading The Damned is so energizing and, 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 and embracing for us. It's both bracing, but also embracing for us because, um, because they give us access to that consensual field, right? Um, and that's, Again, I, I'm going on mute now. <laughs> Sorry. Hey, it's like 305. Rose, um, Bella, do we have questions from the audience? Oh, that Q&A, is that? Yeah, we got questions. Ross, the first one I sent you is from Nicole. Uh, and I sent it to you in the chat. Um, okay. Okay. And the chat is active, so good luck on the treasure ch treasure hunt of finding it. Um, <laughs> Maybe Nicole, you could you could put it in there again. Oh, I got it. Yay! Thank you. Um, Nicole would like to ask, I'd love to hear from some of the more, most engaged theorists of the conference's two theme concepts, the undercommons and destituent power, destituent power, how to bring the two concepts together. So how to bring the undercommons and destituent power together. If the undercommons already exists all around us, what needs to be destituted? If destituents is more a potentiality than a power, as Rodrigo reminded us yesterday, then how, then does it really already exist in the undercommons? 
I'm posing the questions in a way that tries to highlight the differences between the two concepts, particularly their temporal differences. The conference has posited their similarity and overlap, so I want to come at it from the direction of their differences in order to push our thinking on them. I guess it will work like this. Let me think. Um, so if, if the undercommons is already there, then to some extent, you know, constituent power is already there as well. Um, you know, if, we get, if we're gonna follow Agamben and theorizing constituent power as uh, something that arises from a certain paradoxical relation between constituted and constituent power, then there's always for him a sort of nullity in between constituted and constituent power that we call constituent power. All right, we'll say that again, all right? So if there's a paradoxical relation of sovereignty between constituent and constituted power, then there exists a void that he's gonna demarcate as constituent power. Now, uh, this reading, I guess, was kind of, uh, generated some controversy last time I pushed it, but I really think that there's a split, there's a change in Agamben after around 2004. And so I think post 2004 Agamben would just be totally down with that level and say, decision power is already there. It's something just that we have to show, all right? And it's how we show this paradox of sovereignty that, that highlighted that uh, is, is the task here, right? But I think pre-2004, Agamemnon, who I tend to side with a little bit more, is going to say that there needs to be this kind of entanglement of constituted and constituent power that brings out constituent power. Uh, and he's going to identify that uh, in the state of exception with civil war and revolutionary violence. Um, so I guess I think there's two ways of looking at that, that question. And I definitely lean towards the civil war, revolutionary violence side. And uh, now I'm gonna go on mute. Did anyone else wanna address that at all? Stefano, did you wanna take it up at all? Um, <clears throat> I mean, you know, you all know that we're kind of shy about uh, separating out our, our concept too much as we've just been talking about, you know, from anything else. So um, uh, I understand, Nicole, that these are also, you know, we do it sometimes just to think, um, but, uh, you know, I mean, if you think of where Agamben is coming from and, and, you know, I don't mean to be too unkind, but I, I see what you're saying, Idris, and you could very well be right about that break. One thing that doesn't change um, is his reading list. Um, you know, uh, he's decided for whatever reason to not avail himself of a 500 year tradition of destituent practice. Um, and, you know, I think that has some consequences. One consequence it has, is not a citational consequence. It's actually just, you know, as McCritchick says, not noticing. So if you wanted really to locate constituent practices in Italy, when he's coming up and thinking about all this, you'd be doing it in the feminist movement. You'd be, you'd be talking about Silvia Federici and Leopoldina Fortunati. There's a great conversation between them in fact, that I can share in the chat and you can see that's where constituent practices are coming from. But that doesn't show up for him, you know, just like a lot of other shit doesn't show up for him. And I think that has consequences in, in, in your ability to, to make something out of, out of uh, you know, to make, make a term available, make a term, you know, uh, uh, you know, 
contain that kind of stray, stray generosity where you don't know uh, what could happen with it. So, um, so I'm gonna share that uh, piece with you because um, it makes the point better than I would. Yeah, I, I actually, I agree. Yeah, I mean, he, he he's lacking a, a lot of concrete examples of what constituent power is, right? And, um, and, and I, I do think it's a fault. Um, I mean, and, and one of the things I argued in this constituent power lecture that will probably never come out or maybe one day or whatever, but uh, is that um, one of the problems with not giving concrete examples of it, and, and, and you know, he could definitely be faulted for this, but other people can't, like Colectivo Situaciones can't, uh, you know, is that without giving clear examples in the world we live in today, uh, and, and the way that society functions today and the way that the apparatus of capture is constantly in play is that constituent power maybe in a year will just be about like guerrilla gardening. When I'm saying, when I'm thinking that he wants to take it as more and if we want to use it, we want to take it as more. Um, I think of, uh, and, and, that, and that's going to be a real problem if you don't say, this is what I mean by destituting, right? Um, I'm thinking recently now about, uh, and I, I'm sure some people have seen this, um, recently there was this kind of black capitalist initiative that took up this understanding of uh, allies versus accomplices. And the person argued, yeah, we want accomplices, right? So, you know, this discourse of insurgency, this discourse of destitution, this discourse of the under commons, all these radical discourses that are out there uh, if you don't give them concrete examples, they're just going to fly over to a sort of, they're going to be taken up and, and retooled and repurposed and made into liberal discourse. So, um, and I think the only way we can at least sort of combat that is being very clear about what we mean by these things. So I want to agree with you there for sure. I'd like to um, actually push you a little bit, Idris, to talk about something you mentioned um, two comments ago. Uh, you just so you just glossed very briefly this notion of civil war, um, and I think you you included it in your uh, discussion of con constituent power and its relation to revolution. And in your recent piece, or one of your recent pieces, the the eulogy to Michael Reinald, um, you have this section on civil war in which you uh, affirm that there is no really escape. Uh, from an imminent civil war. And we, as, as we were reading it, we were really curious as to what that meant for you, especially as we live in a country in which the specter of civil war has been, you know, in the mainstream news and even in the international news for the past four years. Um, and we're wondering if you have maybe two different conceptions of civil war there, one of which makes sense and one of which should be avoided or what more you think. Great question. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I should say that I have like a bit of a daddy complex with a Gombin. So, you know, sometimes I'm like trying to like, you know, be like, I got this. I'm going to, I'm going to overtake him. And then sometimes I'm like, okay, yeah, I, I got to rock with him. But um, uh, so now I'm going to pull in a Gombin move and say that I've been really hazy about the notion of civil war and have not given any concrete examples of it. Right. I've given examples of what I don't want the civil war to look like, but I've been pretty uh, uh, obscure about what I take it to be. So, um, and, and some of this is intentional, all right? Like, so I want to think of civil war as a very broad concept, all right? And uh, the best I think I can do is say that there, there I want to outline two necessary but not sufficient conditions for civil war, okay? So two necessary conditions, right? One I want to say is civil war, and I, I said that in the Reinhold test, text, is that I want to think of civil war as this back and forth exchange of forces, all right? And number two, the second secondary, the second necessary condition is that I wanna think of civil war as a series of divisions, of ciceras, of splits, all right? Of cutting, bifurcations, all right? So civil war for me is exchange of forces and splits. Now, um, now for the first thing, uh, I wanna say that it's exchange of forces because the first condition is because I think politics, at least we think politics for real, if we're not, playing games, if we're not just, you know, doing just empty talk, politics is always about power and force, all right? No matter which way you play it, you know, it's always about power and force. Some people are just better about hiding it than others, right? Or so certain parties or factions are better about, about hiding it than others. Secondly, 
Um, what I tried to argue in that text when I went through uh, how whiteness is constituted, I think that civil war is what divides every sphere of social life or every sphere of life within America, say. So civil war is the splitting of personal and family relations. Civil war is the breaking of labor and exploitative relations. Civil war is the breaking of uh, all other kinds of bonds. And, and most importantly, I want to say, uh, it, it's the breaking of certain legal mandates. It's the splitting of them. Um, now, and most importantly, I want to say that civil war is a cut that runs through the very, the very concrete being of American citizenship, all right? So uh, what it is to be an American citizen is split in half, all right? So civil war is something that ultimately we even fight within ourselves. Um, now, I think that some of the pushback, at least I got, I mean, so it's rare, but I mean, it's not rare in the sense that it comes out, but people will be like, hey, Idris, you know, you, you got to be clear about this, right? And like little kind of like shade emails, right? But, um, and those are always the ones that, you know, hurt the most. But uh, Civil War, I want to say, doesn't always inv involve firearms. And this is what kind of I was taking the task for, right? Uh, Civil War doesn't always involve firearms, but firearms should not be excluded from Civil War, all right? So, uh, and I think offhand rejecting guns, uh, first of all, it, it's, it's just naive, right? I mean, we live in America, the guns come out, right? No matter what, we can have the most peaceful protests in the world and someone's gonna get shot. Um, number two, I think that if we leave out the question of guns or we leave out guns, and you know, it's an open question of our relation to guns, but if we leave out guns entirely, then I think it's kind of an insult to all the people who've been killed by police bullets in the past year, right? And I think it's a bit of an insult to all the people who have been hit by imperialist bombs over the past 150 years or so. So, um, and that's how I see the firearm issue, all right? But the, the real part about civil war is exchange of forces and division of social relations. And now I'm gonna hit you, all right? Thanks for the, thanks for the question. How is that different than the basic structure of neoliberalism? Neoliberalism as the like horizontal dispensation of violence and like privation everywhere and the splitting of social formations, even nations, even like, even things that we're also against, but just the breaking apart of everything. Yeah, I tried to argue in how it might should be done is that, you know, you know, there's this splitting apart that's going on, right? And, it, and you know, yeah, maybe it's, it's, a, it's a, a condition of neoliberalism, like it's this kind of balkanization that we've seen in say Yugoslavia or, you know, uh, all over, right? Um, you know, it's kind of micro-nationalism that we see in say like uh, in the Basque and the Catalan struggle or whatever, whether or not, you know, you're gonna say that's liberatory or not. But, you know, the Yugoslav wars, there's not much that's liberatory in it, right? But um, uh what i argued at least and you know maybe this could be open for a better discussion is that you know these forces are playing themselves out and it's our our uh it's one of the things we need to do is just to dwell in those forces at least from an american perspective right you know we have this behemoth you know leviathan country of like this massive uh monster of a country and i didn't i don't know if i got to say this in the the past uh thing i did on youtube but um you know I was looking at when the when when the police station burned down in Minnesota, I pulled up all these books on coup d'etats, right? And you know, I read through all these books on coups and like, okay, let's make this happen, right? But you know, one thing that was difficult about reading one thing about you couldn't apply these books to the American context is that there's never coup d'etats in countries of this size and this complexity, right? So it was a strategic uh, choice to say, it was, a, it was a really for a strategic level to say that we need to break apart the country or the part, if the country's being broken apart, we need to dwell within this splitting and, and you know, force it in our direction, all right? So we don't have something like Yugoslavia, right? But uh, um, it's something that we have to understand is happening and use to our advantage. Okay, I'm gonna pull up another question here. Um, this is, um, we often connect this moment in relation to the Zapatismo 
the seeking of the non-aligned left, la otra of indigenous futurities or messages from the future that digs into the undercommon. So a question for all of you, how do prefixes of anti, A-N-T-E, I am, un, 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 a prefix is a portal, call on the dead or undead as sight, sighting of making what we have not made fully concrete. I can read that again too. If you want. Ross. Yeah. Could you read the last part again? I I fell yeah, off yeah. the train. Yeah, yeah, I, it just like disappeared a little bit. Um, let's see, where'd that go? Um, shit, it just went away. If you go into the Q&A um, and then go to the answers tab instead of the open tab, it's there. Oh, I see. Oh, cool. <laughs> I'm not good, I'm not good. <laughs> we often connect this moment in relation to the Zapatismo, the seeking of the non-aligned left, la otra of indigenous futurities or messages from the future that digs into the undercommon. A question for all of you, how do, prefix, how do prefixes of anti, the A-N-T-E, M, un, 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 a prefix is a portal, call on the dead or undead as sight and sighting of making that we have not made fully concrete. I'm sorry. I just needed one more time. It's the last yeah, 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 part yeah. where I get lost. Yep. I get yep, lost yep. in the last part. Yeah. How do prefixes of anti, that's the A-N-T-E, yeah. I am, and then there's uh, quotes, U-N, un, 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 a prefix is a portal, and that's an end, end quote. So the quote is un, 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 a prefix is a portal. Call on the dead or undead as sight, sighting, like a place and a sighting of making that we have not made fully concrete. Okay. Um, okay, well, well, maybe, maybe one such prefix is the non, N-O-N, okay. Um, and this is something, I guess, I, this is maybe what I was trying to get at a little bit before, but I know I didn't do it very clearly. Um, in, in, in this distinction between let's say the conceptual and the consensual, where if, you know, um, so there's an essay by Sylvia Winter that was published, I think in 1976 called Ethno or Sociopoetics. And, 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 the way that I've been trying to think about conceptual kind of comes from, you know, attempting to, to read and, and reread, you know, this, this essay. But, but what, what, what Winter does is she wants to make an argument that part of the dilemma of the culture of man, let's say, but part of the dilemma of the culture of man is a refusal of thought, a refusal of what one might call the non-conceptual in thought. Um, and, you know, like all throughout maybe her earlier work, and, and in this respect, I think it corresponds in all these sort of beautiful ways to something that you might get in, in Fortunati or in, in Federici, like in Caliban and the Witch, but 
but but and or it or it, it could correspond to the sort of beautiful ways that even a gombin tries to you know it's what i would call you know a gombin's medievalism everything steve said stefano said was right you know a gombo didn't pay a gombin didn't pay you know sort of any attention to really to, to black thought or or black history written in the in the largest possible non-national frame he seems to pay no attention to that whatsoever but what he does pay attention to are these modalities of of a kind of let's say i would use the term like forgiven or pre-given you know modes of of intellectual and social insurgency, you know, in 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 the pre-modern world, right? That 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 sort of exists in a way that we might say is before the fact of the mutation of culture that Winter describes, you know, in that in that essay. And um, and so what I guess I'm trying to get at is is that yeah, these these prefixes, the non, the the anti, spelled with an e. What, what they all indicate is that is as as Stefano says, you know, and as he was quoted as saying, that the insurgency comes before power's response to it. Right? It's it's already given. Now, to say that it's already given, or to say that it is pre-given or forgiven, that it really sort of exists before the very idea of the given, to say that doesn't mean that it doesn't differentiate. To say that doesn't mean that it doesn't change. Okay. Um, but, but to talk about its differentiation is to talk about how that differentiation, again, in Denise de Silva's words, manifests itself as it were, without separation. Okay. Um, this, this constancy of change, this constancy of transformation is precisely what power, whether it takes the form of the police or whether it takes the, form, the intellectual modality of a kind of conceptuality itself is always trying to regulate. Okay. So our, our task, you know, it seems to me, is one of deregulation. And the reason why we would imagine something like an anti-politics is because I just don't know of any instance in the history of politics or any possibility in the theory of politics that that can that can that doesn't that do, in which politics at the end of the day isn't finally governed by the regulatory impulse. And our impulse our thing, what we try to save, how we try to live, okay, is, is anti-regulatory, is deregulatory, right? That's, that's, so the reason I invoke Winter there is because so much of the work she does, but she's not alone, you know, so much of the work that Amiri Baraka does, so much of the work that, you know, Nathaniel Mackey or Wilson Harris or, you know, Gail Jones, what they do is they attempt to constantly give us concrete examples in and from our history of the irregular, of that, of that which resists regulation. That's what Ross does, right? That's what, that's what beholding does, okay? That's what the doctor was doing on the basketball court, okay? Now, you know, that's what George Floyd was doing is this, this constant eruption and innovation, so to speak, of the irregular. Okay. Um, that's what we try to defend. And we defend it by practicing it. Okay. Um, that's, 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 that's what we're, 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 trying, to, we're trying to do. Um, there's more to be said about the winter. You know, she associates the the non-conceptual with the individual in the particular. And, you know, we, we can revere her while we also disagree with that part of it, you know? What if it turned, I believe that the non-conceptual is better understood in its, in, in its irreducible entanglement with the non-individual, but that's, 
you know, those are those are arguments we could have at, at, at study. OK, but but I but I guess I'm trying to say that I mean, I'm and again, it, it, if you wanted to think about it in relation to Zapatismo, we, we could, too. And and we do all the time, at least Stefano and I, because because of the influence of our friend Manolo Callahan and, and Gustavo Esteva and 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 folks who are invested in the, the, the structures of, of and techniques of obligation, right? That are that are simply not predicated on a metaphysics of separation, right? That 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 Zapatismo wants to mobilize in order in in, in self-defense, but which Zapatis but which is also that which Zapatismo attempts to defend. Right. Okay. So um, in 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 the war that it now must engage in against the war on subsistence. So I think that there's the one thing that we have plenty of is concrete examples. Um, and those examples stay with us. They 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 quite literally inspire us. We breathe in and with those those examples. Thanks for that, Fred. That was wonderful, absolutely wonderful. Um, if I may also add just a little bit to that. Um, so on the one hand, like the original question, on the one hand, I'm, I'm aware that there's a, a way that one might understand the, the un or the anti or the in or m as kind of um, looking to, looking to, looking to uh, extinguish life um, as a kind of resource for the now living, when those very extinguished lives cannot be, um, whose, whose, res whose resourcefulness um, cannot be used on their behalf. I, I get that on the one hand, it can be read in that way, um, that then kind of uh, utilizes these um, uh, exterminated lives in order to make our lives better. Um, that's on the one hand. On the other hand, though, I really, really love the language Fred gave of the non. Um, it's the language I often return to, um, specifically with respect to gender non-normativity. Um, so for me, the non is a really particular kind of prefixal gesture um, because it's it's not simply a, for me at least, it's not simply a reaction to this thing. Um, it's, if if I may cite a TV show um, that I absolutely love, there's a TV show on APO called Succession. Uh, and there's uh, one moment in which uh, one character is talking to his sister uh, and he simply says, so are you declining then? And then she responds kind of incredulously saying, I'm actually not climbing. Uh, so there's this really weird, interesting neologism that she's doing there. Um, but in effect, it's saying, I'm not agreeing to the very terms and conditions of this very conversation, of this mode of structuring our relation right now. Uh, so I want to think of the non in that way, um, by way of thinking about how, how is it that we can how is it that we can actually not say no necessarily, but in the kind of vein of the black vernacular, how we can say nah, uh, like how can we swerve in excess of the very term and condition that we have? Um, that's what, I'm, what I think I want to think through with respect to these kind of prefixal negations um, in a way that's not necessarily a negation, but an excess, um, but a way to, to exceed the very term that we have at our disposal to think about the very intelligibility of life and liveliness. How can we think about other ways of, of um, gesturing toward different modes of relating to one another rather than simply, um, I'm not doing this thing that you say I need to do, but I'm not even, like we're not even playing the same game. Uh, I'm doing a different kind of thing over here. That's what I wanna see or make use of with respect to the, these kind of negating gestures. I wanna ask a follow up on that. And this is to the group, the, 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 that as a kind of refusal um, or a, a refusal that is also an action or an imaginative thing. I'm kind of curious about that as, as a relation, as how it relates to joy. Actually, <laughs> that's, that's one of my questions. I don't know. Um, it's, 
I think so. I, I guess I'll answer this in two parts and they won't be very long. Um, on the one hand, I think about um, people who have influenced me, namely someone like Lamar Jarrell Bruce, um, definitely someone like Alexis Pauline Gums, these people who just like exude this sense of joy, um, not even a joy that's, that's um, living despite the various kinds of modes of oppression that we face that betide and accost us, but rather just like modes of joy that are immersed in the very spaces that those kinds of oppressive apparatuses cannot even reach, um, that there's a kind of immense joy in that. Um, and for me, it's like, I don't know, I, I just want to be happy, I guess. I and mean, I know it's not very much a choice, um, but one cannot simply choose to be non-abjected. Um, I get that deeply, but for me, it's just like, I, mean, I want to be over here doing my thing, doing my thing with other people, um, doing my thing with other ideas, um, kind of a kind of contentness with, um, with thinking and living as if those modes, those apparatuses of capture and oppression are irrelevant, uh, which does not negate them, I know, um, but rather how can I express a kind of prefigurative modality of living that renders those, um, those ways of structuring my life via um, curtailment and circumscription irrelevant? Um, how can I express a kind of irreverence toward those kinds of ways of living that are not in fact ways of living, but ways of foreclosing other possibilities of life? Um, and then that is a profound joy for me. Let me pull up another question here. Um, actually, this is actually this is a, a question that follows that a little bit. Um, in the undercommons, Moton and Harney write, we are anti-politically romantic about actually existing social life. How do we move from the romance of insurrection, of the insurrection, the fleeting moments of festivity, conflict, joy, revolt, to the more quotidian and durational ordinaries? Well, uh, as as everybody can see now, I guess I'm I'm the I'm the talkative one. Um, so, I, but I but I always feel real bad about it if it makes you feel any better. Um, but that question, Ross, seems to me to be an extension of the previous question, you know, about joy and. Um, Well, Alice Walker once said, resistance is the secret of joy. And, and maybe that's true. I think that's part of it, definitely. But, uh, but I also think that, uh, you know, that, that the quotidian nature of, of study, of being with, people and being with people in a way that is um, always animated by criticism in the way that Marx talks about that word. He uses that word, or at least it's in the translation that I prefer. It's, there's, there's a clear distinction, it seems to me, between his use of the term criticism and uh, and, and, and the notion of critique. Maybe there's somebody who really has German well and they can show me how what I'm saying is naive. But, but I prefer to believe that, that the distinction between criticism and critique is a, is a useful one and a, a, a great one. And when Marx gives us just a few little hints about what communism might be like, he talks about it as, you know, in terms of what we like to think of as study, you know, which, which is both of these things, not just one, but study being when you wake up in the morning and, 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 and do the work, the, the, the tilling cultivational work that is, that goes hand in hand with your subsistence. 
And then in the afternoon, you engage in criticism. Um, and 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 the, that's the quotidian practice that we're, you know, invested in. And we're investing in it not only because it sounds good up in the future, but we're invested in it because it, it is good now and it was good then. Um, but it's really, really important, I think, to, to make a distinction between criticism and critique, okay? As a kind of pseudo-intellectual, hyper-academic mode of sniping and fucking with people and just being mean and being nasty and being evil and talking shit under your breath or in your little fucked up Twitter universe where all you ever wanna do is fuck with somebody because they don't do exactly what the fuck you think they should do. Or you wanna fuck with them because they, they haven't mentioned the people who you think they should mention, or they haven't read all the shit that you think should be, should be read or addressed all the questions that you feel like have, you know, should be addressed. That kind of nastiness, particularly when it comes in the, in the, in the, in the, in the form of, you know, a kind of righteous left politics or righteous left internationalism or righteous leftist Afro diasporic thing is, is some tired ass shit, you know? And, um, and, we, and we could stop doing that, you know? We could stop doing that. That, that would make everybody, uh, including the people who engage in those practices, it would make everybody a little bit happier, you know? I'm tired of constantly being pissy, you know, with people upon with whom I agree on 99% of shit, you know? And, 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 and when I say these things, there's certain people I'm thinking of and certain folks I'm talking about, but on the other hand, I'm also always talking about myself, you know? I, when I engage in that kind of nastiness, that's, it's fucked up and it leaves me unhappy in addition to whoever I make unhappy by acting that way. So, um, so I would love to be able to stop doing that shit myself. And I would like other people to try to stop doing that shit too. So. Um, I'd like to jump in some, I, I love everything Fred was saying. I feel like I've said all that stuff. I think we all feel that way probably, but fuck the haters and all that. But um, basically I, I wanted to kind of address the feeling that the daily desires and practices of, of normal people um, is somehow expressed in the insurrection um, or that the insurrection is like kind of the armed uh, deployment of daily life. Something about this, um, like I, I just want us to like maintain a certain relationship to also the things that we don't understand and the things that we don't know that we want. And to understand that the struggles that we see in the world today and that many of us experienced this summer partially also emerged from the ability of people to break apart the structure of their desire and to learn to want things that they didn't know they wanted. Um, to open up that vortex for one another um, as well. And I think we should just retain, like, like there is a connection between the, the quotidian and um, the way that translates with political force or violence, like the, between the quotidian and the event or something. There's not a dialectical relationship. The one does flow into the other uh, in, a, in a kind of mode. But I think we should remain agnostic about how it does that. Um, I, I, I'm scared of um, um, the kind of language of prefiguration to which Marquise mentioned, although although that's just a word, you know, like, like, and I was vibing with what you said, but like, I just want us to maintain agnostic because we actually don't know, uh, like we know a bunch of shit that we like to do and we know a bunch of stuff that we don't like. Um, but I do, I do think there's a special possibility afforded to us when basically all of the people who are acting, who are acting out and all, all the young people who take over the street and who, who create this vortex, create this festival, um, new things become desirable actually. And, and it is the same kind of 
um, you know, it's the same, same people in one way, but it's also different people. Like the people, it's not like in this apocalyptic way, it's like a new humanity, but it's, we, we, we become transformed when we exert ourselves and we, when we allow ourselves to be unmade by the power that we also set in motion. Um, there's not just some primordial reservoir that we're just drawing and drawing and drawing from. And if there is, we do need to understand that partially as a function of governance as well, because we're not strictly the objects of control, but we are the products of control as well. Um, and, and, and all the things that we want and all the things that we say and do um, are not just held down by power, but uh, built, by, built by power. Um, and our idea of what the sensible world is and of what, what we are within it, all of that is, um, is not, is not, and I think we all know this, but you know, that's not a pure space that we just need to unleash. It's also a governed space. Um, so, 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 so for me, I think like a revolutionary task is about setting in place the conditions in which we can gain control of the emergence of our desires, not just do what we want, but begin to articulate a common path um, you know, a common path with, with common kind of, uh, uh, not now I'm falling off the rails. I think you get what I'm saying, but yeah. I, I know I said I was gonna shut up, but I just wanted, I said something stupid before and I wanted to try to correct, not stupid, but incomplete um, with the critique criticism distinction. And I was, there's a great comment by Gabe Salazar, um, where he, he says critique is the, or they say critique is the theoretical limitation of a thing. Criticism is to evaluate based on different things. And, and I, I could have been a little more clear in defining the terms, at least as I, as I was abusing them, which is because that notion of critique as setting a theoretical limit as Kant does, you know, or as Marx does with political economy, or as Kant does with the subject, that that's not the critique I'm I'm, I'm trying to to to, to be um, <laughs> to, to 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 put under some kind of restraint. The 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 what it is that people nowadays call critique is 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 never about it seems to me establishing a theoretical limit um or or setting theoretical limits it's it's usually about shutting down a certain kind of conversation and and that modality of critique is what i'm trying to to see if we can set aside for a while and then by the same token i don't mean to suggest to to harken back to a notion of criticism that is absolutely bound up with evaluation, but rather a notion of criticism, which is kind of really all about what it is to pay attention to that which you think of as invaluable. Um, you know, whether it's a flower or something that someone just said, right? So that if, if we respond to what one another say as if it were outside of any kind of equation of value, um, to use Denise's phrase again, I wish she were here. So. Sorry. That might um, that might roll into this maybe probably last question. And this is a uh, Janan says thank you for this discussion and a live thinking together. Can folks talk and share a little bit about how you find these practices of criticism and study and undoing? deregulation, et cetera, expressed in the domestic interpersonal relational spheres in the interior, like how we practice with ourselves, our families, children, loves, et cetera. No, 
Um, I, I would just say, I, I don't, I don't know. I think we should kind of fight against this, the segregation of interpersonal um, and uh, probably political would be the other one or something like that. Um, I think you, the questioner probably thinks that too, um, but in a way that might be a little upside down from how I think of it. Um, and I just want to say that I, I it, there's nothing not interpersonal about the crowd of people that burned down the third precinct and the, all of the kind of, um, kind of forms of like maroon care that were taking place in the crowds, uh, you know, in these large crowds that were actually nurturing one another with actual medical care, like big shout out to like all the like random nurses and like medics that show out to all these big events, taking care of people, like, like for real taking, not just like treating people's wounds, but like making people are okay. Like, like, Hey, are you okay? Catch your breath. We've got like water, we've got medicine, we've got like all this stuff. I, I just want, wanted to, to throw that out there as like, I just wanted to connect more, maybe something that might be separated with someone else's answer. I don't know, but I, I just, just all, all the care of the insurrection is not like something that occurs really separate from the moment of the clash. Uh, as we know, like these, these different scales are very, very, they touch like two dimensionally, they touch like two pieces of paper. I guess maybe I'll sort of re um, just like restate one part of it. So it with a, a kind of interior. So the how do we do these practices with an interior? Maybe maybe in a I don't know if this is quite um, maybe you're addressing this already, but interpersonal like um, what is the work the interior work actually that that these practices make possible or require. You know what I'm saying? Does that make sense in the question? So I think Janae's asking, how do we do it in these smaller, smaller social spheres? And I'm all, and I'm adding to that question, how do we do it internally? You know, which Fred a little bit alluded to when he was when he was saying like, I don't like it when I participate in this shit either. You know, this, you know, the the critique um, as a kind of interior. Um, getting to know whatever, thinking about that. Does anyone have any any response to that? I'm just trying to get a little bit into Janae's question, which I think is a, a beautiful one. Um, well, maybe if I just start with the, something obvious and then and that might help with what else we could do is that <clears throat> the intimate sphere is amongst the most uh, regulated of all spheres. And um, we've seen that, you know, during the, the pandemic, I think, um, with this reconstitution of the nuclear, with the forcing of, of, you know, choices about who you're with and who you're not with, et cetera. It reminds us how regulative is the, is the form. And one of the forms that that regulation takes is the insistence on something like the interpersonal, as if it were true that like two nations who are gonna about to have diplomatic relationships, there was one person who then has a relationship with another person. Um, and in that process reinforces the notion of the very kind of individuation that Fred and I were always, you know, inspired by countless thinkers inside the black radical tradition and, and even beyond. I've always been trying to um, trying to, to to escape as much as possible, um, and nowhere more does that show up in the in the way that regulation in the family takes the form of roles, um, and takes the form of roles in, into which one inserts these putative persons, um, and and yet at the same time, there's just most obviously so much opportunity to study in that kind of way where the, 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 the fallacy of the person falls apart. We think about, you know, if you have a, a nephew or a niece or a child who lives with you, 
um, and is involved in the education system, you know, every day there's an opportunity to help that child and for that child to help you um, with, with all of the, with all of the uh, false um, promises and false uh, steps that are being made uh, in a formal education environment uh, in the United States or anywhere else. And, and, you know, one could go on, but the point is that if study is anything, it's a place where we help each other fall out and fall apart of something like the interpersonal um, and into our uh, already existing sharedness. Um, and so uh, I can't imagine, not only can't imagine, but I, every day we practice as much as we can um, study at that level um, and um, study at that level, you know, with partners, with, 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 with kids, you know, brothers and sisters um, is an effort to undo the very distinction between something like the interpersonal, the small scale, the intimate, um, and coming back exactly to, I think, what a good point uh, that you guys raised in the Vilos International, you know, um, trying to, to get rid of that line uh, between this interpersonal and this intimate um, and our larger forms um, of ongoing social life, you know, you know, we, that's what we mean when we're talking about study and grounding. We're not primarily talking about, you know, going out somewhere else and doing it. Um, we're talking about, you know, doing it right where we are. Um, and and that's, that's how teaching should probably be approached as well. Well, we're at four, Rose, Janan, oh, okay. I'm sorry, Bella. Um. Happy to be called on uh, with Janan. <laughs> <laughs> my dear, my dear Janan. <laughs> um, yeah, I think we're, um, I know that Rose uh, is like physically at the Institute of Advanced Study. Uh, and so I'm going to, since her corporeal being is connected to a uh, place, whereas the rest of us are just in our homes in front of our computers, I'll let uh, her call the shots on when we call this thing. Um, yeah, I think, oh, I'm echoing. <laughs> I'm on a, whoa. I'm scared to talk. Is it, okay, I think I'm here. <laughs> I have two screens, so sorry for the echo, y'all. Um, but yeah, I think, uh, <laughs> let's, uh, I think, you know, I wanna respect people's time and I think, you know, ending here seems fine with me if everybody else is cool with it. Yes, thank you so much to everyone. Thanks, Marquise. Thank you, Fred and Stefano and Idris and to Ross for facilitating and Bella and Ross for putting this together. Yeah, thank you, everyone. It was fun talking with you all. Thank you thank for you. making the time. Yeah, thank you all so much. This was an amazing conversation. You were so generous. And tomorrow there's um, another panel um, continuing the Undercommons and Distituent Power Conference called, um, let me get the correct name here, Hostility Inside and Around the Fort, Fugitive Approaches to COVID Era Conflict, happening at 1 p.m. Um, it will be facilitated by Sam Law with panelists Edgar Illis, Laura Harris, Melania Lamb, and Brian Whitner. So hope to see you all there or on the live stream as well. Thanks so much for being a part of this and continue thinking together. Thanks again. Have a good one, y'all. Thanks, Ross. Thanks, Bella. Thanks. Thank you. Good to meet you all. Good to see you all.